Okay, well, we're at uh, seven o'clock here, so we should uh, get started since um, um, I know we have uh, um, someone here from Tennessee. Right. Uh, uh, cool. That'd be Craig down there. Is that hey, him? Craig's sitting in the um, wings there. Uh, Mike Lynch is here from um, oh, uh, City of Boston to talk to us about 5G. Um, okay. There he is on the um, other corner. Applicant. Okay, uh, Mike. Um, okay, so uh, <sighs> to do our little blurb about our open meeting law thing there. Uh, okay. Yes, Chris. Do you want me to read it or or? I, I just have to. I have to find it. That's all. I've got it. I can start. Well, let her let her read it. Go ahead, Danielle. Okay. Please. Uh, statement regarding remote participation, uh, pursuant to Gov Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, um, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this meeting of the North Reading Community Planning Commission is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so uh, by visiting um, https colon slash slash us02 web.zoom.us slash j slash 985430926 or by calling in 301-715-8592 meeting code 8. Nine eight five four three zero zero nine two six. Thank you very much. And for the uh, and for the record, this meeting is being recorded. So, Mike Lynch, we are very much looking forward to uh, what we can learn about five G from you. This is uh, uh, we did we did this before when we first started with cell phone towers. We learned a lot. It helped us make good decisions. We're hoping you give us that same help. Okay, a high bar indeed. Um, I have a uh, slide deck. I don't know, uh, Danielle, if you want me to uh, share screen. Sure, you can go ahead and do that if you'd like. And I didn't have a strong sense of uh, exactly what it was that you were looking for today. So I have a whole bunch of slides here and I'm gonna run through them very, very quickly. Okay. If there's an issue and you want me to, um, we can revisit anything, okay? Okay, and thank you so much for um, no for doing this for us. We really thank you very much. Yes, really, thank you. No, listen, I, I do this all the time, and uh, we work a lot with uh, MMA and make some presentations. Uh, this year, we didn't do it at the annual meeting, what with the COVID stuff, but uh, actually, that's how I met uh, Matt Fair when we were doing this stuff about 15 years ago, and he was working for the MMA at that time. Okay. So at any rate, this is just a quick snapshot map. We, uh, we post our locations for all the small cells we have in Boston. And uh, it's been it's been growing over the last five years. <laughs> a lot of companies out there doing it. And, and 5G, is, uh, 5G is a very small antenna. It really only runs about 300 feet in terms of coverage. So these things are put in kind of as a stopgap uh, in areas where there's either very high, de high demand and they can't take care of smartphone needs or there is a lack of coverage. Um, we started this, we started, uh, we've been doing 5G in Boston for about 15 years. The last five years, it has really heated up. Uh, the industry, uh, I hope none of you are in it because the industry can be pushy and demanding. It's really hard to work with. Uh, they spend a lot of time going to Congress and the FCC complaining about cities, towns. One of the reasons I like talking to other towns is it's, it's nice to have allies in this fight, right? We're all trying to just basically do our job to take care of the public good and take care of the public roadway. And it's a little tough to be getting beaten up for trying to protect our own assets. So it gets a little confusing. Um, we have shared goals, right? Public wants this stuff, but we also need to take care of things like uh, historic preservation, landmark areas. Uh, if you have made investments, I'm assuming North Reading has a significant number of their own street poles as opposed to uh, utility poles with street lights on them. Yeah. Yeah, so- Yeah, we do. So they're going to come in and they're going to want to be on your asset. And that creates a whole different issue. At that point in time, you will have uh, what we do in Boston is we actually say, okay, you want to use our street light? We don't have conduit for you. We don't have power that we can give to you. Our state law prohibits it. And you have to bring in your own fiber. So quite literally, they, they remove our street light pole and they put in their own street light pole, which reverts to us in terms of ownership. But they have to do this because they've got to put all these pre-drilled attachments in there. They've got to put cooling units in there. They've got to put radios in there. It gets, it gets pretty convoluted, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty complicated very fast. 
But if you if you if you have a uh, if you have an area of your city which you're trying to protect uh, the aesthetics of it, if you will, you have a right to do that. So you can say, no, no, yours is going to look like what you replaced. And I, I'd encourage you to keep going down that road. I think earlier, Danielle, I had sent you a cheat sheet from a group called NATO, or I'm, I'm active in that group. It's a National Association of Telecommunications <coughs> Officers. It gives you a good breakdown on some of the federal restrictions and an outline. I'm not going to get into that here. Frankly, I think you need to have a lawyer reading over your shoulder when you're reading it. So they'll rely on you, Danielle, right? No, and I'll we'll <laughs> rely on our lawyer. <laughs> okay. So a lot of people ask, what is uh, 5G? Uh, this is the best definition that I ever heard. And it was last year on CNN one time when somebody just said, it's a myth. It's absolutely true. It's really a yeah. myth. Uh, this, by the way, I shared this with uh, Danielle as a PDF, so it'll be available to all of you if you want to look back at stuff. 5G is really the fifth generation of phone service by cell. That's all it really means. It has no high special technology to it. And this is sort of the, the normal pathway, if you will, of a cell call, right? You remember this from when you were looking at the macro cells and they probably explained this this way. All the small cell is doing is replacing the macro cell. With a macro cell, the tower may have a reach of 10 miles. The small cell has a reach of about 300 to 400 feet. That's the distinct difference. But it still needs all of the other components in the pathway. What What's being used in this fifth generation, this 5G of cell phones are different radio frequencies. Um, the last five to six years or so, FCC uh, reallocated a lot of spectrum, right? They pushed TV stations off of a lot of their analog channels, forced them up to some digital channels so they could open up some spectrum space and they sold it to the wireless carriers because high demand for wireless service was exceeding the capacity of the frequencies available. So they offered some new ones to them. And now they have sort of three big buckets, a low, mid, and a high band of service. That's sort of where the high band is. The high band is very, very fast. So it's good for things like autonomous vehicles and uh, fast computing, I guess you'd say. So there's very little what they call latency. Um, the downside is it freaks people out. It's, uh, it's something that we end up dealing with as local government. This is just a snapshot. I think I actually got this from the uh, government accounting office. And it's a snapshot of a New York City map of the propagation of the frequencies in 5G. But it, it's pretty illustrative, I think, because uh, the map on the right, the mid-band, those are high, uh, lower frequencies. So they propagate well. They go through walls well. They go through stone, et cetera. So you see there, the propagation is fine. 5G is very fast, but very light. It bounces off of walls. That's why, and they can direct the signals. So a lot of times what you see in 5G is it'll actually just shoot down the street. It's not shooting into the buildings. This is, uh, this is a slide I often share with uh, citizens who get concerned when a small cell is in front of their house and they say, well, what about me? I'm, I'm sleeping near that thing. I don't like it, you know, especially in Boston where you might have a row house that's 10 feet from one of these poles. They get very concerned and rightfully so how it might hurt them. Again, just for illustration purposes. Um, again, just a reminder here and a link to a couple of things that are available. I think the GAO, the Government Accounting Office has put out probably three or four different reports on 5G and wireless propagation over the last year and a half. They're, they're very good, uh, they're very informative and their information is much better than what you get from the FCC or the state. In Boston, we do something called licensing, but I, I don't know, I can't say for North Reading, I, in talking to Danielle, I didn't have a sense that anybody was clamoring at your doors right this second, but you know it's gonna happen soon if it hasn't already, that people are introduced, uh, wireless carriers or neutral hosts like Crown Castle, American Tower or Extinet are coming to you and saying, I want to, we want to do business with the town. I assume some, some sort of overture has been made. Um, not that I know of yet, but we with, are just trying to prepare because we know it should be coming. All right. We did something called the license. You may not need to, but uh, mm -hmm. later on in the presentation, the, the FCC has gotten very strict with local government and they put a lot of shot clocks in here so that when you get an application, don't don't just leave it till somebody has a chance to look at it. Review it almost immediately. Find out what it's missing and convey that back in an email. 
because if you do not, the clock ticks in the 90 days you have to make a decision are used up while you're waiting for someone to come into the office or for you guys to have a meeting, whatever the case may be. It is, I think it's a, I think it's a regulatory trick really by the FCC to do it to local government, but the way they sped it up was they put these shot clocks in so that if you do not approve something in 90 days, it is deemed to be approved. So it's just the one warning. If you, if nothing else, I wanted to leave you with that one one piece of advice. Okay. Well, they they did something similar to that with the Telecommunication Act in '86, where they yep. where they put all of the pressure on you to to uh, to allow this to happen, and saying that the uh, that the providers were given a mandate and that you had you couldn't interfere with the mandate. So that's it exactly right. Yes. So again, this is really just for illustration. These are the different types of poles you might see. One thing in Boston, in Boston, we said you can go on the streetlights. We're not letting them do their own freestanding poles or slimline poles, anything like that on the right. You can go on the utility poles and you can go on our streetlights. If you go on our streetlights, you have to replace them. And then the utility poles, well, they have a process for that anyway, so they're fine, you know? But the, it, it is a little chaotic, particularly if you have a nice quality streetscape that you wanna protect. If somebody comes in and says, I want my poll right here, to put a poll out of sequence with others is a, is a glaring disruption, if you will, to the aesthetics of your streetscape. So don't let it happen if you can avoid it, right? Okay, if I may, we sure. one of the things that we, we have a historic district that we put all of the electrics and everything, all everything underground. Great. The only thing we have is some, some street lights, but also a subdivision control law requires that a subdivision have all of the utilities underground and the only thing we will have there would be uh, street light poles. Interesting. So I mean, so this is, I think this is an important point as to how we, and again, it's all the newer subdivisions and some of the higher end subdivisions where they would most likely really be looking for this 5G are gonna be the places where um, there is um, only light poles. Right. And so some of them are decorative. So they're going to have on this, I'm showing you like we do these cooperative designs. If somebody comes up with a design and we agree to it, any of them can use it. You know, we're not going to go down this path repeatedly on the same concepts. But on the left there, you're seeing a kind of an historic district pole. And because it's a dual, we don't know really what to do. They have a slim line type of uh, antenna. So they're putting that in the middle. They don't love it. It's the best we can do. We don't, thankfully, we don't have a lot of those poles. But you'll notice in the bottom, you're seeing both power and fiber. Mm -hmm. if, if they're on a utility pole, it's a different issue. But it, it, from what you tell me, if they're on a street light pole that you own, they're going to have to bring their own power and their own fiber. So, so this is more than one pro, uh, project, right? They're not going to just replace the pole so that they can put their equipment on it. They're also going to have to trench the street well, with either with Eversource or on their own in order to bring in fiber and power. Uh, the reason I included this slide here was I mentioned earlier you're going to have uh, you're going to have radios, fans, uh, different network cards, etc. They need a cabinet. The cabinet's either going to be at the bottom, as it is in the middle two, or up in the air. And you can have a voice in where you want to put this, uh, depending on how crowded your sidewalk is. You may not want it at the base. You may want it up in the air. We find a lot of times, we, for that reason, we had narrow sidewalks. We'll say, we'll put it up 20 feet. And then we found some of the neighbors saying, you know, that big refrigerator box is right in front of my front window. Move it. <laughs> so you can never quite get this right, but it is worth thinking through. Um, again, this is on our city website. If you want to look at any of the licenses <coughs> with the providers, they are available. I'm not sure that North Reading will get to the point of a license if you are... If you're entertaining, when it comes in that somebody says, hey, we want to do small cell in North Reading, your best bet is to go with the neutral host, I believe, because they can carry up to three carriers. If, you, if it's Verizon or it's AT&T, they're not going to host another carrier. And so that means that somebody else is likely to come in right behind them and say, we also want a poll. We want to be treated right. in a manner that's similar to those that are already here. <clears throat> uh, Again, you probably know this stuff as well as me, so I won't really get on it. The only thing, uh, I think Warren, I think it was you had mentioned it earlier, FCC makes a big stink about level playing field. You yeah. have to treat telecom companies equally a little bit. So you cannot be, uh, you can't give a sort of what could be perceived as a preferential treatment to one over another. Now, I understand that. Can you give me an example of what you would consider to be uh, an independent contractor or a 
Should, I think, oh, what I mean by that, the neutral hosts are- Neutral hosts, but like Crown the, Castle? The, the tower companies are now in the small cell business. So American Tower, Crown Castle, and yep. XDET are the three who are most active in the Northeast and particularly in the uh, New England and Massachusetts areas. Right. Okay, thank you. We use a form online. You could do the same thing. This is just a copy of our website and there's a map on it. The link is there. This is the simple form that we try to take the, uh, how do I put this? The forms can be complicated. There's a lot to put in there. And if you ever get to the point where you kind of, like somebody starts to come in and you want to make sure you ask the right questions, be happy to share with you what we have. But we forced them to fill out the form. We'd use just a very simple Google sheet actually uh, to have them fill out the form. And when they fill out the form, if they're missing anything, the back end of that Google sheet uh, kicks them a denial saying it's incomplete. So the clock never starts until they actually have a complete. For example, uh, you know, Verizon keeps coming in and saying, we want to put in 500 polls this year. Well, we look in there, we look in their bucket and see what they have. They have 400 that are in process with incomplete applications. That's not on us. That's on them at that point, right? They have not completed the process to really submit the application. This is workflow. It's our workflow. It's not North Reading's. I just wanted to put it in there because it is useful to sort of map this out at some point, what your decision matrix is. There are too many, there are too many activities going on at once. You think that they're just putting up a small cell, but you know, they're impacting your lighting system. They're impacting your underground by bringing in conduits for power and for fiber. So it's worth looking through this process a little bit and then trying to figure out, are we going to live within the mandates of the FCC rules for this? I'm not going to dwell, dwell on this one too much. I, I'm trying not to take up your time. I'm running through these a little bit. I apologize if it's too fast, but uh, here's a rough, I, I don't even, I put this in here because I own the slide. There's a couple of simple examples of nothing special. One is the base unit is there on the right. Um, that takes up about 42 inches square. And wow. the, uh, the one in front of the police department across the street from me, uh, as you can see, that's a unit that's up at about the 14 to 18 foot height. So downtown, that's perfect. In front of a house that's close to the street, they may not like that version. And what we track a lot of here, you notice in my bullets is how long it takes us to approve a process. It's pretty tight now because we've, we've been at it for a while and kind of worked the kinks out. Mm -hmm. Right. This is, I'm not, I'm not really gonna put them in here. I just wanna have this, I'm not gonna discuss this too much. I just wanna put it in as a uh, placeholder. These are the orders I mentioned from the FCC on, which kind of really, I think, preempt local authority. There's a couple of, um, a couple of court cases going on now. Local government has an appeal and the uh, small cell orders from 2018. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the lawyers talk a good game on this one, but I don't think we're going to win. <laughs> I don't know another way to put it. You know, A little more detail on the same orders. At this point, they're saying we're going to go to the Supreme Court. You know? I think when you end up going to the Supreme Court, you've already lost. And we're not winning much at this point. We're not going to win the whole case. One thing I forgot to mention in this is that when you, when a carrier or a neutral host comes to you and ask, can we use your poll and you own the poll, just remind yourselves that you're at that point, you're acting as a permitting authority, but you're also acting as a landlord. They owe you a little bit of rent and you have a little more flex and say in how they treat your, your property. Well, the majority of our, if I may, the majority yeah. of, our, of our properties that are that were properly built have um, have a, a pretty good set a front yard setback at 40 yeah. feet or better right. and as a result of that uh, the ones that are part way up the poles would not be in anybody's window so yep. so we, we so as you know um, and so in that case the majority of what we would have um, would probably not be offensive to the people in these neighborhoods however having said that what about um, I know I've seen some some uh, places where they've actually done underground bubbles. I'm, I'm sorry. Under, oh, underground. underground um, yes. Yeah. Um, is, that, is that just not 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 a uh, something they would do because of the moisture issue and so forth? It it doesn't work here because you know at the end of the day they're actually putting switching equipment in here, yeah. so it needs fresh air. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So the underground the underground vaults don't really work. It's un unlike electricity or gas. You've right. got fans and electronics in there. So 
And they used to do like Comcast in the old days used to do that sort of thing. And they put like a, uh, like a rubber bubble around it, you know? Right, right. But if you had torrential rains and that, and that fault flooded, it would shot out the equipment and they had to replace right. it, you know? Okay, well, it's a question that will be asked. So I right. wanted to get it out there. Okay, so listen, that's it for me. I just wanted to keep it keep it as tight as possible. Also, I'm, yeah. I'll put in a little plug for Natoa. If anybody has any interest, there is a uh, webinar in a couple of weeks. Um, they'll discuss some of these issues if you if you care to understand the order better and the impact of what the FCC is doing on local government. That's about it. So, so Danielle, um, we we have um, we're, we're looking to develop a, a bylaw for this for allowing the five G in and what we would what we would want to do. So that's why we were so interested in what you had to say. Mm -hmm. So that means that our, our uh, bylaw is going to, would have to address in some ways, perhaps where these, you know, where these, where this equipment would be placed. Because it really seems um, the majority of the light poles and the you know, utility poles are like 100 feet apart, more or less. And so that means that, you know, every three poles, you're going to have to have some kind of a, uh, a unit that seems pretty, that seems pretty excessive when you get right down to it. Um, so I guess um, what that that begs the question of what are we going to how are we gonna, what are we going to allow? Are we going to be are we going to be happy with uh, stuff up on the poles and what's our bylaw going to say? Because what we decide now will make it a lot easier when somebody comes in the door with a proposal to 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 be our 5G provider and I, and I certainly appreciate the the, uh, the hint that we should get a, an autonomous uh, provider who will take care of everybody and then not just and not let, uh, we ran into that with cell towers. We let one cell tower company in and the next thing you know, we have two or three others wanting to yeah, go. Yeah, then it gets problematic, right? Exactly, so, so, we, so we're familiar with that process. Um, <laughs> but um, um, so having an independent contractor of some kind come in like Crown Castle come in and do, take care of everybody at once probably is a, is a positive thing. Um, but we need to, you know, we need to decide what we want, what we're going to be, what's going to be acceptable uh, aesthetically in the town before one of these people knock on the door so that we can hand them uh, a zoning bylaw or, or some level of, of instruction as to what we expect them to do. Um, one thing that um, town council has done for us is they have prepared a draft policy, which would be for the select board in their purview to, des to decide what goes in the, the public you know, right of way. And another would be um, a draft zoning bylaw for us to decide um, how to regulate what goes on private property. And I think both are really good, um, but what's left, what they leave blank is for us to decide what the recommendations need to be for aesthetics. And you know, I've asked the question and I haven't really gotten an answer yet. And I don't know if, if, if Mike, you're able to guide us with this at all. But, um, you know, for example, it's up to us to decide how big the boxes are. Well, how big do the boxes have to be? It's up to us to decide where the boxes go. Well, where can they go? I guess I, I struggle to make sure that we, we have to meet, you know, the FCC's requirements. But I don't know how far we can go with saying we like this and we don't like that. And I'm not quite sure where to go for that guidance. Well, I'm pretty sure that that 42 inches at the base of it there are too many places where we have those poles in the middle of sidewalks or close to the middle of sidewalk. Well, there's already an issue with getting by. So, so having a 42 by 42 square at the bottom of some of those poles would just would block the sidewalks off. So that's probably not a viable uh, way of us doing it. And mm -hmm. so the question is, what would what really? I mean, we saw a representative that Mike showed us a representative look at what that would look like with the equipment up on the pole. But I would probably want to see a better representation of that to see what it would really look like perhaps a picture in real life of some kind to see what it would what it yeah. would look like because i think that's really what you're talking about the aesthetics you're talking about what have we what, what's except what manner of providing the infant the the uh, uh the electronics package for this what manner is going to be acceptable to us either over the whole town or in particular neighborhood in, in Boston, we have these licenses with all of them. So they get, they get expedited permitting by having a license with us. And, and we modeled the license much on like the cable licenses of 25, 30 years ago. It kind of works the same way, you know? And the bet one, a couple of the benefits we got was we got a little more, more money out of them, but we got them to agree to certain limits. So I, 
in Boston, we're a little outside of that because because of the expediency of being able to do the installs, they're not fighting us on our licenses. But if they wanted to take us to court and challenge our license, they could probably get away with it. But they'd rather it's in their best interest to work with us at this point. There are, Danielle was correct. There are obviously public right of way issues and definitions of space. And it's about 42 inches square. And I forget it's, it's a cubic feet and it's about the size of like a dormitory refrigerator. That's at least the minimum of how much space they need. That's a new installation. They can come back later and increase that installation by 50%. That's the second part of the same orders. Uh, and private property is treated somewhat differently. And I, I don't know in North Reading, but I'm gonna make a guess somewhere there's probably a radio on a building, like a commercial building or something like that, a wireless unit. Somebody might be hosting one on the roof of one of their buildings. I'm guessing, I'm not really certain, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the danger we're in right now is that they're actually giving up to 30 feet expansion on those units. So in other words, if you're in a portion of a roof, you could, it could be the entire roof by definition in some of the rules that they've just started to install this year. Where they go, I don't know, but I think you're on the right track. I think you're trying to get ahead of it before they come to the town. That's a good thing. Okay, so, so uh, I would I would say that yeah. problem that that uh, the things we need to look at then are, are, you know, how what what kind of installations will be would be acceptable to us on town owned properties, which would have to be approved by the board of selectmen. And what kind of installations would be acceptable on private properties, which is the zoning bylaw that, I'm right. assuming that we would create. But at the same time, um, I'm not sure how we would regulate what goes on the top of someone's building if they are willing to rent for some level of income, I'm assuming, right. some level of income to them to, to mount a radio on top of the roof of a commercial building, for example. Do we, would, do we, can we regulate that? I think the zoning bylaw would because yeah. it would be private property. I, yeah, I think that's probably, a town council. Probably, you probably have a height cap somewhere. So I assume that that would yeah. be. Well, the it doesn't look to me like what, these need to be improve. What you might initially approve under, under these newest rules, which I did not include in today's presentation, what you initially improve as a new installation, they can come back later and expand on Right. By another 30 feet. And if you think 30 feet on a, on a roof is a lot of space, or right. if it's on the ground, like around a pole or something like that, but on private property, that's 30 feet is somebody's front yard. You know? So you're saying to me that we can't really. Um, I, think, I think I'm not, I'm not trying. I'm just, you're doing absolutely yeah. the right thing. You're, you're, you're anticipating the questions before they come. If I can offer maybe one suggestion that's better, because I don't want to presume I know what we do in Boston. I don't know what you do in North Reading mm -hmm. around zoning and around uh, public right of way rules. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm assuming you guys are active a little bit in the Mass Municipal Association. So through Mass Municipal, that ties you into the National League of Cities. I, I could probably find it for you later, Danielle, if you want to shoot me an email tomorrow. But about a year ago, Natoa and the National League of Cities put out a guide to small cell siting and, and a, a uh, uh, not a model, but a suggested uh, ordinance for a local government to use. We're very careful not to like overstate things, but at least it runs through some of the very same questions that you're talking about today. Things to consider as you move forward. Be happy to share it with you. Okay, well, I have a couple questions still yet on this, and that is how, how tall is the antenna, actual antenna that's on the pole? Or I think well, it's, it's, just, short, it's, right? it's, it's as tall as, as tall as y'all let them go. <laughs> Um, well, I know, but the, the frequency, it's frequency, the antenna height is frequency controlled. Right. So if you think about it, so there's a couple of things going on on the antenna height. It depends on what right. type of antenna. Most of them are cone shapes and they put it inside a, uh, a drum looking thing so mm -hmm. that aesthetically you're not seeing too much ugliness up there, you know? Right. What, what gets a little complicated is when you have maybe three carriers on a neutral host pole. Mm-hmm. Those are multiple radios and they have to be some distance from each other. So, so each- So they aren't fair. Yeah, yeah, you could potentially especially be up to 12 feet, 12, 16 feet, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, if to, especially if they're different frequencies because right. they'll cause ghosts to the other yeah. ones. Right. So um, what, what's the, um, all right, well, well, what's the, I know that you said there's, a, there's some level of, my understanding is there's a fairly high level of power requirement for these systems as well. 
Uh, and my understanding is that does, I think I think that that they, do the um, does the uh, provider um, obviously have to lay the lines and 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 provide the power for the for the uh, units that are on the poles, and uh, and they just they pay they're going to have to they're going to have to turn to Edison and get a stub out, get a lateral to bring power to that pole, their own power. They can't yeah, use. Yeah, we have Reading they light. Can't use, yeah, they can't use your. Oh, so you're using Reading light. Okay, so yes, that, that's my. You may want to check with for my question. You may want to check. Are, are you? Um, is that a cooperative relation? Well, it, like if it's a cooperative Dispel. relationship, you might no. be able to get it right. But are you using them as a, as your municipal light company? Yes. Yes. So you may be able to sell it to them. Them so yeah then I don't that's a different situation in our case because we're buying from EverSource right there's something in the state law which prohibits us from reselling our power so we right. can't provide them power might be right. different might be different for you in North Reading well that's the basis for my question is yeah. I know knowing that there's a high power requirement how yeah. is that tracked and billed right and you're not gonna have a you're not gonna have a, a meter an electric meter on every single uh, every three poles. They wanted that. We fought that. We didn't want it on the poles either. Yeah, because now once again that becomes an issue of uh, of aesthetics. That's right. I'm just trying to conceptualize the whole process here. RMLD uh, did reach out to us to say that they wanted to coordinate closely because of their expectation that most of the requests for installations would be on their poles. So mm -hmm. um, that's something I, I think we'll be working with them on. Good. But of course, it could be anywhere. I mean, it might not just be their poles. And of course, well, the issue comes when we get into the uh, the historic district where we have only light poles, and then all the new subdivisions where everything's underground already. So, um, although that may make it easier in some cases because there's already a feed back to the uh, pole, which could maybe be snaked and carry the power back. So, depends on how many how many poles there are between ground transformers. Uh, we could probably figure that out without too much trouble. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, um, anybody else have any questions here? Chris? I'm good. Okay, Dave? We Sorry, just getting off on mute. No, my, my only question I think you, you asked uh, about the, those independent carriers, those neutral ones. Right. So that's answered. Okay, Thanks. Brian? No, I'm all set, thank you. All right, all right, well, um, <laughs> The, the more I think about it, the more questions I have. So, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you're probably in good hands with KP Law, so you'll be doing fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, right. you know, I wanted to learn as much as I can, and I, I, I foresee all of the, I understand the electronics and the frequencies very clearly. So, yep. I, un I understand the issues that are involved here. So, good. Um, uh, so, so let me ask you another question, and you may not know the answer to this, but um, can we decide? Uh, or maybe I should say, is it true that we can't exclude any one carrier? In other words, can we decide that we just want one yeah. carrier and that's no. it? No. Okay. We yeah. have to take that's, them all. Again, that's, 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 so that's why the recommendation is go for the neutral host because yep. the neutral well, host is that. not a carrier. It's right really off. a hotel. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That's, that's I, what I we did. That right off. You heard me, yeah. you heard me pick that right <laughs> up. So, uh, so, so, um, but what that means though, what that means to me is that if we allow, if we do a bylaw that says, okay, you can, you can put a, uh, uh, the, the uh, control box is uh, 16 feet up or whatever it is that they did in Boston. Mm -hmm. And that's your, that's your, uh, that's where your equipment cabinet's gonna go. But then we have three different carriers and they all got their own equipment cabinets. And as, as, as you mentioned, and as right. I understand, we're carrying three different frequencies here. Yeah, the equipment the shrinks. But not that that pole is going to be carrying right. a heck of a load. It can carry quite a bit of weight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are we going to? So, so I mean, and again, a pole clustered with that much weight, um, it begins to it begins to become ugly at the very right. least. Yeah. yeah. So we have no We have no back. Once we allow them, basically, once we open the door, that's it. I think so, and your compensation is slim because the FCC yeah. has capped it. Yeah, that was that was the other thing I was, thing I was going to ask you, but uh, I kind of assumed that <laughs> we well, were we weren't going to get much compensation from them because otherwise, and I mean, they'll just get it back from us by raising the rates. Right. No, when the FCC. Well, so the question is, so the question is, is, is the value 
is the value of this 5G high enough to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, make it worthwhile? That I don't know. I can tell you that in Boston, we have, we have tons of young people and they were the drivers initially. All, yeah, the, all the original placements were, you know, around college and university campus areas, around, right. you know, the highlight points that people want to congregate at. That was the original driver on this thing. Yeah. We're actually finding as they're going down side streets and doing this stuff now, neighbors, neighbors are not liking it. They, they find it offensive and blocking their way. They don't like some of them fear, you know, RF emissions. They don't like that. So it starts to get yeah. really complicated when this gets down to a dense neighborhood level. You, well, you I, I might, you know, I, and I can see that concern because when you got, uh, because the high frequency, you need so much power to get it out there. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that becomes a concern that you've now, you know, you, you got to be able to take an RF meter and walk through somebody's house and find it. Yeah, I mean, I have I have one neighborhood, and they're running around with apps on their phone where they can. Yes. You know, so they're not able to tell you how how aggressively that that signal is propagating, but they can they can figure it out and say, well, there's 15 different radio signals coming off this one pole, and that makes right. them nervous, you know. So. Right. And then right. we are stuck in the middle, you know. So that's that's it is a dilemma. I don't know. I haven't got the answer. If you figure it out. <sighs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, wait, you know, two more years, you're going to have 6G. That's what are they right. going to do? Right. They'll go there you next. Know, so. What are they going to do? Because yeah. you're not Smaller going to be able to support it. It's going to be more power. Yep. Yeah. And it's going to be a higher, it's going to be a, a longer frequency. It's not going to penetrate anything or a yeah. higher frequency, no, I should no, say. No, higher frequencies is a shorter, is a shorter wave. That's right. Yeah. And that's why nice long wavelength wave to go wave through anything. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Well, Danielle has my email address. If you have any okay. questions, or and again, if you want the the NLC guide and model, mm -hmm. uh, we, we'd be happy to. I can dig that out and share it. I, a couple of things have changed in the last year, but I think that is still fairly accurate. Okay. Many years ago, we had a company from New Hampshire come down and do a quick presentation for us, telling us that they wanted to put an antenna on every single pole. Um, in order to bring our internet to us uh, reliably to every single person in the town. And that uh, was a, so um, uh, we, we instantly rejected the whole concept. Yeah. And, and yet here it is on the doorstep. I think I, yep. I think I remember that guy. I think he came to Boston and wanted to do it in the Seaport District. Right, right. <laughs> there you go. And here we are with it on our doorstep again. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, all. Mike. Good to meet you. Thank, Thank you, you Mike, so very much. much for your Appreciate information. It. All right, see you later. Okay, thanks. Bye bye. Take care. Cool. Oh my. <laughs> yep. So, so shall I put this on our next agenda for an actual discussion of the, the hashing out of what we want this all to look like? I, I think so. Um, okay. Um, because I think uh, we got some um, we got some thinking to do about what you know what we want to. You know what we want to do, how we want to uh, assemble this whole situation, because it sounds to me like it's going to be ugly. It is. And it, it and is. And the only real advantage we have is that I mean, when I think about the effort that we went through to eliminate those poles from our historic district, and now not only do we have to keep the poles, but we got to make a massive tree trunks out of them. Mm -hmm. And that's not really uh, it's not really sitting well. Um, but uh, it sounds to me like we're also uh, going to be similar to the Telecommunications Act that we're going to be mandated to allow some level of it in order to get um, in order to get uh, communication uh, capable through the uh, you know so that everybody can communicate on the same uh, platform. So uh, we're going to be kind of forced into it. So I'm not sure what other choices that there are. Uh, I really thought that underground bunkers, if they could have been allowed, would have been the best because at least you won't see them. And they're not that big. That underground, they would take up a lot of space, but I can understand why they're not. Why that they can't be. make them watertight. Yeah, well, you'd have to make them more <coughs> watertight. You'd have to have the vent, uh, you know, a ventilation vent of some kind that ran. You know, yeah. just, you know, all the time, which would let water in and have to compensate for all those things. So putting it up on the pole is, is, uh, becomes one of the only, but it seems a little Neanderthal though. You know, it seems, it's, like, it's, it seems like we have a great idea for, for a communication system and a lousy idea about how to install it. Yeah, it's the cheap and easy way out, Warren. 
Yeah, well, that's, that's what that that's is. The problem. I, I feel like we're not we're not there yet. You know, yeah. we're trying to do something when we're not there yet. I, that's that's my feeling. Because yep. how how the power how much power it takes and how that power is distributed and and whether or not um, it's sort of like comparing the to the computer that took a whole room and now is the size of your watch. You know why? You know we're not there yet to, with this whole process, and so um, we're going to be constrained as to how much we can regiment the thing by the law. So I think we really need to, again, we need to talk to the our, our to a law firm and we need to take a look at that, maybe read that whole law ourselves to see if there's any, um, I would like to read that whole law myself to see if there's any wiggle room in it where we could at least uh, have some kind of, maybe discover an opportunity hidden someplace in there to make this a little more palatable. That's what I'd like to see. Okay. Um, do you think our next meeting would be a good time? I could schedule an hour, just like a workshop discussion for us to talk through different aspects of it. Yes. Um, and in the meantime, we, sh we should all get a look at that. Present we should get a, 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 you know, you know, maybe take a look at the presentation that Mike made and, and you know, you put it on the, in the share. There. And, and we can just kind of read through it ourselves, but also if you can get a hold of the the law that that's that's mandating this, okay, so that we can take a look at that too and see if there's any wiggle room in it. But it sounds to me like if there was more wiggle room, Boston would have found it. But uh, big as they are, but <laughs> but that doesn't mean you know. But you know, we may be a little smarter. Let's see what we can do. I mean, I know just from preliminary conversations with KP, um, there are certain restrictions we can put in a historic district. We can't b ban them entirely, but we can definitely keep them off of our decorative light poles. Um, we can do things like, um, you know, there is a distance we are allowed to say they have to be from private residences. I mean, it can't be excessively, you know, large, but there are some things that we can do, but I think we can have a good conversation about it. Um, well, it's possible that we could put the boxes, the power boxes, um, um, especially in, in, a, in, in where we have municipal properties, like, like across from the police and fire station and the... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, any area there across the schools where we could actually move those boxes off the sidewalk and then, then four or five feet or six feet away and just run the cable over up to the antenna mm -hmm. section, which would, which, so we could keep it a little bit clean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what I'm, you know, I'm trying to think, but it, well, when we get to, when we get to um, the subdivisions and so forth, where the edge of the sidewalk is basically the edge of the layout, uh, you know, the back edge of the sidewalk so on the house side is that is at the edge of the layout. We'd have to actually begin to place in order to in order to leave those sidewalks open and to keep the poles from being too nasty. We'd basically have to uh, put upon the homeowners to allow us to put that box on a little cement pad in their front yard. Yeah. Yep. Hey, you remember a couple of years ago, Comcast started putting hanging boxes on poles? Yep. That's exactly what these are going to be. Yeah. They're going to be about that size. Oh, uh, bigger. Or bigger. Yeah, I'd like to see. And, and again, if we get a chance, if when you talk to Mike, if you can say, can you can you get us a couple of you know real pictures of, of you know a better a better pictorial representation, lifelike, so we can get a better idea what they look like and. Yeah. And, yeah. Because we're gonna we're gonna justify this to somebody. <laughs> Um, can I ask a question about timing? Um, I know that this has come up a little bit over the last few months. Um, I, I know that there are two things that the town will need to consider. I mean, at some point there will be a policy that's needed that governs you know, right, rights of way. And that wouldn't be us, although we could make recommendations to the select board for how to do it, but then we would be also doing a zoning amendment and it would probably make sense for both of those to be taken up you know, around the same time. Um, I don't know anything yet about how limited the June town meeting will be. Do you think, I mean, is there concern that if we don't move quickly that somebody could just come in, like, should we target October, should we target June? I know I'd spoken with the town administrator a couple of times and he kind of felt like maybe June would be a good target, but that said, I don't know, you know, if it'll be a possibility. I, I just don't know how everyone's feeling about urgency and timing. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I wasn't, um... I wasn't really aware of the of the uh, 
uh, immediacy of it, and in other words, how how a time sensitive it might be. Um, you, you know, in our in our area, it might be that they're going to focus on the cities where they can, uh, you know, get more takers. You know, get more people to uh, pay for the thing. You know, in their uh, um, uh, in, in where, where there's a, a denser population, and that we may be on the outskirts and not. In other words, their return for the investment is not going to be that great when we got acre lots, you know, huge distances between houses. Mm -hmm. 160 foot front, that means that, you know, two, two antennas, you get two houses, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's 300, 320 feet, so you got to have an antenna on either one or one in the middle, and then again, another, you know what I you mean? You the other side of the street. Yeah. You yeah, get four so, houses. Uh, yeah, but but still, I mean, is the return compared to putting it up next to an apartment building where you get 500 users? You know, oh, that's right. Flex, you know, <laughs> I mean, there, there's a so so uh, so I, I understand that there could be there could be a uh, a time element here, a time frame element that we would want to get something done prior to being um, prior to being uh, approached and having to give an answer. Uh, um, so I, I mean, I guess we we could work get something basic done. Do, you, know, you, you I know you're not going to do placeholders anymore, but you want to actually put something into the June town meeting as a as a uh, warrant article or, or a zoning I, article. I definitely can do that. It's I mean we do have draft policies. Well, we we have we have a draft. We have we have the drafts from KP. Um, what we our work I think more is going to be is figuring out the aesthetic parts. What we would want to see. Right. And I think those things could be filled in. I mean, I certainly could submit something, you know, by the deadline in March. Well, let's uh, let's do that, you know, because okay. to tell you the truth, we we uh, worst case is we could just pull it, yeah. or pass over it. Mm -hmm. So, okay. and if it uh, and if we don't have anybody on our doorstep at that point, then you know, and, and then we could then we could uh, postpone it if we need, or we could uh, pass over it, and then bring it back in October, which is more of a zoning meeting anyway. Right. Okay. So. Um, um, that might be. Does everybody agree with that? That's probably the best way to handle it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. You guys okay, Dave? Ryan? Yep. Okay. okay. <clears throat> We're just going to do the best we can with this, I guess, but it doesn't sound like fun to me at all. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Um, so we do have nine minutes before I get this uh, public hearing. Um, do your minutes and stuff. Yeah, we can do that. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, do we have we have um, motions, Ryan? Do you have motions in front of you there, sir? I do, Chairman Pierce. Yes. I move the community plan commission vote to approve the minutes dated February sixteenth, two thousand twenty-one, as written. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additions or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Does the record show four in favor, no opposed? Okay. Um, do we want to vote on the 239 North Street plan endorsement? Because um, Actually, we don't have to. Um, we They are still missing some information. They need to submit okay. the fire department, so we'll do it next time. Okay. Okay. Um, the discussion of the 148 to 150 Park Street Senior Housing Overlay District. What do, do we? Uh, what just, do we want to talk about there? Well, I just wanted the opportunity um, before the um, warrant closes, um, and we were going to be submitting the article. Um, I just wanted the opportunity for the CPC members to see um, the the draft that would be submitted. Um, so just in case there was any final, you know, discussion or concern, um, of course, there would still be time to make changes and I would be, um, you know, planning, you know, we'd be planning to have a public hearing. Um, and I thought maybe the proposed date for that could be uh, our April 6th meeting might be a good time for that. But between yep. now and then I just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody was okay with uh, the draft as it was written and I see um, attorney Latham is here and I think yes, I, I saw here. a I new uh, draft so. Could, could I make one comment, Danielle? Please um, do. So we we actually met with the uh, the FineCom um, on um, February seventeenth, and we made some revisions to the um, to the bylaw. Uh, they were 
we got a, a, the sense that they basically wanted all the affordable to be very clearly cut and dry located on the premises. And so uh, we revised the bylaw um, in, in what, what's going to be theoretically known as 200 171 that um, would basically reflect that fact. So basically, it removes uh, the A, B, C, D. Um, if you'd like, I can, uh, I emailed a copy to you. Uh, earlier, I think, Danielle, or today, you may have seen it, I don't know, but I can share my screen if you want to try that too. If you could, that would be great. Yeah, sure. we, did, we did talk about that a little last night at the Selectman's meeting, the fact that that, that, that you had, uh, they had made it clear that they would rather see this as a uh, all-inclusive situation. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, but you know, FinCom doesn't have a lot of say in that. <laughs> you got to remember that it's 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 it's, it's you know they they're they're there they I don't even know if they would um, make a recommendation about a zoning article Warren would no, they they don't so However, it's not a bad thing I'm not saying it's a bad thing. <laughs> Um, what I was going to say, though, is, however, they seem to echo the, what most of the other people wanted in the room, including the slides yes. and so forth. Yep. So, so there was no, um, I don't think there was any issue with what they, with the corrections that they were made. Chris, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, Abby has her hand up, and I don't know if you can see that, but I can see yes, it. I can see. Abby, go oh, ahead. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I believe that at the... Um, at the meeting last night, I made it very clear that this was not a finance committee decision. You did. You that, did. That they, yes. were, they that um, Mr. Wheeler and his uh, retinue were looking for feedback and what we thought. Um, I think the finance committee felt that if you, one of the things that was suggested was you could take five affordable units and put them on a different piece of uh, Mr. Wheeler's property in a standalone building. And I guess that our feeling was that kind of sounds like a ghetto and none of us were too excited about it, but we're fully aware of the fact that this is not our decision. <laughs> However, well, I think that it does involve money at some point and we yeah. do have to vote at town meeting. Right. But I mean, you know, this was not something that, you know, we came up with. Right. Mr. Studo, sure. please. Um, thank you, Chair Pierce. So um, for those of you that did not stay on with us till all the very end during the board member reports, um, can I just get clarification and then I have to make a little statement. Um, I, in the zoning, by th this project is for 10% affordable, correct? Mr. Latham. That is how the Chris should have asked Chris for that because well, I, haven't, um, I haven't seen the new one yet. He just answered it. So soon enough, I mean, it will uh, come to the select board, but I'd like to convey that during the board member report, this came up briefly and there were, there were some members, not me, who suggested that all projects going forward, we should require a 20% affordable housing. So I think that everyone on this call should be aware that that was said. So all right, thank you. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, Chris, if you would like to uh, um, just other continue with your screen share. Uh, sure. Um, can, can you can you folks see the screen share at yes, this point? Okay. Absolutely. Yep. So um, first off, uh, there's the 10% right there. Um, I don't know if you can see it. it's page four and it's basically in section 200-171. Uh, yep. uh, honestly, I don't know at what point uh, a project does not become of this size doesn't become uh, economically feasible if you have to push up to the 20, 20, you know, 20 percent mark. Or so. Anyways, with that being said, what we did is, and and I, it, it absolutely is right. It was not um, FineCom didn't make any vote or decision. But what we did here is a number of the uh, FineCom committee members basically expressed what we interpreted as. Um, a preference for having the affordable units actually located on the premises. And so with that being said, we revised this section 200-171 and you can see the highlights uh, right here. So we basically remove language that would have otherwise allowed it to potentially be located elsewhere. Right. And um, we also, I'm gonna just move this over. We, I know you we also, eliminated that, right, the payment in, in, in lieu of, yes. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. So the yeah. Uh, right here, this section here, I don't know right. if you can see my cursor that removed yep. it. Um, so we removed A through E. That means that the property thus has to have the senior housing development has to have the 10% located on the premises. And um, we added this language here because there was a concern, you know, as to compliance with the HCD. So we added this particular sentence and um, we took out the fractional, some fractional language, which was down here. So right. it's much, we're keeping it simpler and stupid. It's just basically more straightforward. It's going to yeah. be on the property. Um, and, and that was the change that we heard uh, coming from Finecom. Okay. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, closing your screen share temporarily. Yes, sir. And I'm just going to uh, pull the board real quick as to what their feeling is, because that seemed to me to be to be a, a consensus. But um, um, uh, Brian, I'll start with you. What do you think about just keeping the 10% in the units, in the in the units, the way he's got the bylaw written now? Um, I, I didn't necessarily have opposition to it being outside of the units, but if, if that's the direction to proceed, I don't have any objection to it. Okay, um, Dave, what do you think? I agree with Ryan. I don't have an opposition to it. Yeah, well, to opposition to what? Putting it elsewhere or leaving it in? No, leaving it in as a 10% within. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Well, well, I guess I was looking for an answer. To your, would your preference be to leave it in or to put it someplace else? I think if you were doing the 20, then you might open it up to outside, but I think the 10 is being fair and then keeping it inside is keeping it focused where it should be, I think. Right. Okay. Chris? Yeah, you got a couple things to consider. What, you know, this is, this is going to be, uh, I think it's a 55 and older. Is that right, Mr. Latham? Yes. Is that what you're shooting for? So. Yes. At least one, um, one member, one, one owner or one applicant has to be uh, 55 or older. Okay. So that, you know, you're going to be taking those affordable units and they're going to be basically of 10% affordable, but really looking towards the older folks. None of the younger people are going to want to go there. They're not going to be allowed to by, you know, because right. of, of the way it's written. Right. If they're off site, they could be a different style house or a townhouse, less people around them. And you've got, you know, you can put all ages in there. So, you know, those are the things to look at. I didn't mind it being offsite as long as we got it. And we've mm -hmm. done offsite before. It was only a single unit at, at a, a subdivision up on Marblehead Street, as you right. recall. And the house was, was smaller but it looked just like the houses he was building in the subdivision. You know, they were absolutely comparable. I'm sure that the materials inside were not the same, but they don't have to be. That's the, that's, you know, the, the, the law. Um, it's just, you know, if they were offsite or they had the available, uh, the possibility of putting some offsite, it opens that up to a larger um, stream of people and how they may think about them. I, th I think my concern um, uh, it was that uh, we would have to then pick a location, uh, either buy or uh, that we are that we bought or that we already owned, and that the construction of those might be a ways off as we try to work our way through the logistics of getting uh, those outside units built, as opposed to having them incorporated into the existing system, which which would be built along with everything else. So I. Oh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, too, with the, with what Chris said, I, I I agree with Chris on that on that. But if if it is open to all ages when you move it outside of that area or that footprint, then it's kind of it's not accomplishing what we're trying to do here, which is provide right. affordable housing for fifty five and over. So I agree with Chris. Though I, I I understand what he's saying there, and that would be say we were looking at one an affordable development that wasn't fifty five. Um, plus, then we, I, I think I would side with what Chris said, you know, because that mm -hmm. does kind of spread it out a little bit. But I think on this one, we need to keep it focused. Because if, it, it, unless you're telling me that that one offsite would have to be also 55, then okay, you know, maybe then it doesn't matter. But, but if it has to, if it, if it has to open up to anyone, 
at that point, once you get outside that district, then I'm not sure if that's the way to go. Okay. Well, I wanted to make sure that the whole board was had, had a chance to opine on that before we went on, Chris. So do you want to continue on with that or you want to address some of those issues? Uh, literally, we will do whatever the, the board decides that they think is appropriate in terms of the location of the affordable housing. I mean, obviously, when we put forth the initial draft, it was to give some flexibility, but um, we, we basically heard what the members of the FINECOM said, and um, we, we whatever you folks decide is, is acceptable for us in that regard. Um, I would like to, um, if Larry is here... Um, I don't know if he's here yet. Um, I wanted to show, because we had met on, um, it was the 3rd, February 3rd, we had met with the Historic District Commission, and um, we had made some, uh, some plan uh, rendering revisions that Larry literally hot off the presses. He just, he just finished them tonight. Um, we are hoping to go back to the Historic District Commission, um, you know, hopefully within the next couple of weeks so that they can uh, review them and, and see what their take is on them. And we are obviously hoping to get back before the uh, select board. Um, and at that point, if we go back before the select board, um, which we thought would be appropriate to occur after we met with historic uh, district commission, um, we were hoping that perhaps a member of the CPC could be present as well to discuss the CPC's general uh, position on some of these matters? Well, I think what we would like to do now is to, uh, since we just got this, uh, these, this uh, change in your proposed uh, zoning overlay bylaw, um, that we should, all, we should all read through it and at the same time get a chance to look at those renderings again. And uh, perhaps at our next, meet, next meeting, uh, do we have enough time for that next meeting to, to spend a little time in the final review of this before we move on, Danielle? We can, but I would need to submit the warrant article um, the day before that. Uh, that doesn't well, mean- I think it, Again, I don't think it's an issue if we submit the warrant article and then have to make a minor change to it um, or, or reference a later plan. Um, I don't think that's an issue, so um, so we could certainly do that, and that would give us a chance to review what we got here and and go back to uh, and go back and discuss it. So I'm going to put a couple more minutes into this, and then we're going to move on. So Dan Mills, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dan Mills, Five Green Meadow Drive, North Reading. Um, I'm also on the Finance Committee, and. While some may not see this as a financial uh, impact, um, I think there is. Um, and one of it is, is um, you know, by not locating the units on site, the affordable units on site, there's a burden placed on the CPC to manage those. And uh, there's funds given to them, you know, to locate housing, then they have to, you know, find an appropriate project. Um, you know, the burden seemed to be shifted towards the CPC to administer that. So that's why I thought it was a good idea to have it kept internal to the project itself. Um, and that, you know, there probably would be, if, 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 if it wasn't within the project, then I didn't think that there would be an immediate uh, accomplishment of the goal and the objective to have affordable housing, um, you know, readily available. So um, one of the point that I had was um, the density. The density of the project, I think is about 10 units per acre in and around that. And that, that pushes the limits of a 40B project um, they might actually even be considered a 40B project with that high of a density. Uh, I know um, many of the other projects um, are much less than that. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the 40R project, the very project was about 10 units per acre. I think the um, um, Martin's Landing project is over 10 per acre. Um, those are really, we consider those large, really large projects. Um, I think there's also some of a misnomer that the new housing will go to North Reading residents um, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, he, the disclaimer is in there that says it was well, as, um, as a, you know, as permissible by law, um, there will be uh, a local preference. I'm not sure that there is a law that allows local preference 
And I just want to make that clear, if they are to be on the subsidized inventory considered in, in, in on the subsidized inventory list, that they need to meet a lot of object objectives, and it needs to be certain 100% that they will meet, the two bedrooms will meet and be allowed to be on that affordable uh, inventory, that the age restriction, even though it's on there, will still be allowed, it won't, dis it won't um, disqualify it from being on the subsidized housing list. Um, again, back to the, the, the sort of the misnomer that the new housing will be for North Reading residents. Um, I think less than 10% of the units that have been sold over at Martin's Landing right now, less than 10% have been for North Reading residents. Uh, I think there's been over 100 sold and there's, there's less than 10, I believe, that have gone towards, uh, or, or there's 150, say, and, and, and less than 15 have been gone to North Reading residents. Um, this would compete with, you know, some other projects that North Reading has in mind. Um, you know, uh, one is the Carpenter Drive project, one is the uh, Town Center project, and, and obviously those are not immediate projects, but it will compete with those. And the affordable require, uh, component to this, again, um, you know, Martin's, this is being compared to, you know, more luxurious Martin's Landing project. So the, the accomplish, we're trying to accomplish um, affordable, um, smaller scale housing for seniors. And I don't think this, the, the product that will be sold here is gonna meet those objectives. That's, I'm not, I, I'm, I am not against the project. I'm not against it. Uh, but those are just some of my concerns uh, with regards to the, to the project. Uh, thank you for your time. All right. Okay, Chris, if you can quickly. So, um... Chris, what was the uh, historic district feel how, how, when you when you spoke with them? What was their what was their feeling on this project? Our our feeling on it is that they were somewhat supportive of the project. I mean, obviously, as part of the project, the historic house, the McLean House, is going to be moved and put on secure foundation. So that's part of the project. Um, Larry's actually here now. And he can show you the proposed rendering if you want to see that as well. Um, that that revision to the plan renderings that, that he has tonight are based upon our understanding of what they were requesting from from the, the last hearing. A couple of quick points, if I may, in regards to Mr. Mills, the, the master plan, which he knows very well, he knows it much better than I, because obviously he was a member of, of the drafting of it but it does call for more senior housing in North Reading. Um, you can't have senior housing for people in North Reading to live, remain in North Reading if you don't build it. And so here's, here's an option for it to be built. Uh, the revised bylaw, as I stated, it does have affordables now located completely on the site. It, 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 it just has to be on the site. That's the way it's written right now mm -hmm. with, the, with the revision based on our comments from FineCon. The density of 10 units, I, I can't verify that. That would be an engineering uh, question in terms of units per acre. But a 40R under, under the statute is basically 20 units per acre. So it's not anywhere close to a 40R. Right. And um, there is local preference that is allowed. It is allowed. It has happened in many communities. So local preference is allowed under mm -hmm. state law. And there is a, an affordable component. And the affordable component to this actually allows this project to be economically feasible. If you okay. start jacking up that number with having lower density, because this does have lower density, this is not a 40R and this is not a 40B. And if you right. jack up that density, you're gonna make this project infeasible and, and you're not gonna have anybody that's gonna be able to build a project like this. Right, Danielle, oh. you had a comment on this? I didn't, but I can offer one if it's helpful. I mean, the local preference. Um, is, oh, I didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I, I should put in, though, the local preference would be a percentage of the affordable units. It doesn't apply to the market rate units. So Martin's Landing has no affordable units, which is why anyone can purchase there. There's there's no local preference at Martin's Landing. Right. If, if you don't mind, can we turn it over to Larry just so he can show you the, the the draft that he, he came up with after our meeting with the Historic District Commission? Okay, we have a public hearing that we're late on now, so that's why I was trying to move along, Larry. Right. 
Okay. You could be brief. Well, that would be good. I'll be very brief. I will, I'll hardly even say much. Okay. Well, I, I am, just so you'll know, uh, I am planning on bringing this back at the next meeting for some final review and, and perhaps a vote. So. Okay. Terrific. Well, this, this was actually the image that we showed you last time. Uh, with and in general, we we then had had excellent input from multiple sources. You all, the historic, FinCom, everybody had a lot of good things to say. And and if we have now made a rather significant change to a much more, uh, we'll call it eclectic group of buildings, as opposed to a large building with with broken down forms. And I think that's that was something we were hearing very clearly was the our, our new building was not as 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 responsive to the McLean House as it could be, and we couldn't agree more. And uh, we took a much harder look at things. So we we have essentially now taken the, this right end of the building and given it more of a a, a barn utility barn feel to it. Uh, no, not a whole lot different in general character, though, from uh, uh, general store down the street and the uh, uh, public building right next door on, on the ends of those buildings. So that's this is a similar, but, you know, it's our own thing, but it's similar. We've picked up um, a uh, sort of a three story version, but more of a um, kind of a Newburyport Salem um, three-story hipped roof colonial element here to uh, to play off of the Jared McLean, and then we've we've kind of tied together some of our elements in the middle here, so that we really have a grouping of buildings as opposed yeah, to the Larry, previous. Larry, we still we still have the original version up there. Yep. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, all right. So there's. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I've been talking about all those. Yeah. Holy moly. Move. I'm so sorry about that. Um, let's see. <clears throat> I'm going to get the right one on here now. So I got it. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's so, a little different. <laughs> so there we go. So all those words have to do with this image. <laughs> My apologies, Paul. Uh, so hopefully that 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 the comments though this this being the barn element on the right end, mm -hmm. the three-story um, uh, simple federal colonial hip on on in the center, and then we've we've jumped some of the, the materials over into the middle of the site, but have have begun to relate some of the forms to not just the Jared McLean, but also the surrounding buildings at this point. So I think that's, as much as anything, we just wanted to show you, we've, we've been responding in, in no small way to uh, comments and uh, hope, hope this is starting to hit the, hit the mark even better than it, than it had been before. Okay, Larry, Hello. thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> before we move on, um, uh, Bruce, do you have any comments you'd like to make um, real quick before we uh, move on on this? Because what my, I don't know if you heard what I said before, but we're going to review the, the, uh, the change in the, in the uh, overlay district bylaw, and we're going to spend a few minutes looking at this, and at our next meeting, we'll, we'll give a final uh, opinion on it. All right, that's, that's great. Oh, you disappeared, Bruce. Chris and Larry um, uh, really covered everything. Um, so, uh, I, I don't have anything else to add. All right. Thank you. Wanted to give you that opportunity. I appreciate that. Thanks, Warren. Okay. Okay. If you could uh, remove your screen share, please, unless anybody yeah. has, so I can see if anybody has any comments or questions on that. There you go. Okay. No comments or questions on that? I, I have a request. Yes, please. If, uh, Larry could, uh, share those new, uh, new drawings with Danielle so that we could, we could get the, uh, sure. um, you know, PDF copies of those online. That'd be great. Yeah, definitely. So we can take a look at them ourselves. <laughs> yeah. We can, Before the next I'm looking meeting. at them on a little screen. I could put them on a bigger screen. Exactly. Yeah. That's why I wanted to wait for another meeting for us to yeah. get a look at these and 
And also, to, I want to review that. Uh, I do want to review that that uh, that overlay district bylaw real quick to see what's in it for sure. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the board on this right now? Okay. Hearing none. Thank you guys very much. And um, yep. And and thanks, Chris, for your presentation. And uh, and Larry, Thank I you. do like what you did there. That looks nice. We'll we'll. Uh, I'm sure I'll look forward to looking at Great. a little. All right, thanks, thanks for your time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks, Mark. Thank yep. Um, all right. Uh, 110, 124 Main Street, Reading Lumber. Special permit request, floodplain special permit. So this says continued public hearing. I, I don't remember us <laughs> starting too much of a. No, uh, that actually, it needs to be opened. That's not. Yes. I was going to say this is not a continue. This is a public hearing, a brand new one. Um, so, um, do we have a uh, a hearing notice? Uh, Ryan, do you have a? It's under application, Ryan. Do you, uh, Chris? Can you dig it up quicker and help him out? Or yeah, I'm looking at it. All right. Why don't you go ahead and read it for him? Notice is hereby given that the North Reading Community Planning Commission will hold a virtual public hearing on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 at 8 p.m. on the application of RECR Realty LLC for a site plan review and floodplain special permit for the property located at 110 and 124 Main Street, map 24, lots six and 55. You may participate in this hearing online at https colon backslash backslash us o2 web.zoom.us slash backslash j backslash nine eight five four three zero zero nine two six by phone at one nine two nine two oh five six zero nine nine meeting ID nine eight five four three zero zero nine two six or by one tap mobile at one nine two nine two zero five six zero nine 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 eight five four three hundred nine twenty six number us new york meaning id is nine eight five four three zero zero nine two six this hearing will also be broadcast live by norcam on their local government access channels, channel 22 on Comcast and 24 on Verizon and on their streaming channel online at http colon backslash backslash norcam.org backslash vod.htm. Okay, thank you, Chris. This will be a lot easier when we can just all meet in person, you know. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot less numbers and words and stuff and and ryan will get to say it next time yeah that's okay. I found it. you want me to read it yeah it's okay <laughs> you always seem to take your time finding this well that's okay that's okay Chris. I, know you, I know you have the stuff laid out pretty good so we appreciate your help in every single instance well i got two computers running that's why <laughs> yeah well you do a good job for us so we appreciate that believe me <laughs> okay uh does uh some a presentation on this particular issue uh, I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, but my, my name is Andy Street. I'm a civil design consultant um, representing the uh, applicant RECR Realty tonight. So, yep. okay, if I share my screen here, show the plan. Sure. Yep. All right. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, this is um, 110, 124 Main Street. Um, these are tax maps 20, tax map 24 lot six and lot 55, both of which are in the highway business district. Um, I'm sure everybody is relatively familiar with the site, but you've got the Reading Lumber store and the um, other associated uses located on the, the southern parcel, parcel, which is 110 Main Street. And then uh, the uh, applicant also owns the parcel to the north of it, which is 124 uh, Main Street. So really the work is taking place on 110 Main Street, but there is a little bit of impact onto 124 Main Street, which I'll, uh, I'll get into. Um, the uh, um, 
we've flagged the, the wetlands. There's wetlands on site located to the uh, left-hand side of the page in the west. Uh, Martins Brook is back here. And then the, the uh, floodplain in, is shown in this dashed green line. So the majority of the site is really in the floodplain um, and in particular, the project that we're dealing with tonight. So we're seeking that we have site plan review uh, for the construction of a new structure and then uh, also a floodplain special permit because uh, most of this work takes place in the floodplain. Um, the project itself involves the removal of a, I think it's about 2,600 square foot storage shed. So it's this blue line, this blue square rectangle here. If you can picture the site, you have Winter Street over on the right-hand side. Kitties is there. You come into the site. There's a, a drive aisle that, that comes around the right-hand side of the main retail store. And then it's this first storage shed that you would see on the right. Um, it's got another storage shed right next to it. And then as you move down into the site, there's other storage sheds, there's propane tanks, there's things like that in the back. So this building today is used for lumber. Uh, contractors, homeowners come, they uh, can purchase lumber, pick it up in the storage sheds, take it out. As I said, it's in this blue square here. And the proposal that um, uh, Reading Lumber would like to get approved is this red square here. So that's about, that's 60 by 60, so that's 3,600 square feet. So a slight increase in footprint, um, generally in the same location. You can kind of see how the blue front of the storage shed lines up with the, uh, more or less with the red line showing the front. Again, access through here and you'd enter the storage shed in through here. Um, the slab elevation is uh, scheduled as of now to, to remain the same. That's at 75.6, which is slightly uh, below the floodplain elevation, which is 76.5. So today it's slightly below the floodplain. And what we're proposing is to um, really leave it the same at, at the uh, elevation 75.6, right below the floodplain. The new structure, so there's a little gap between the existing storage shed over here and the one that exists today. The proposal is to have these two structures really butt up against each other. They won't be connected. Um, there'll be no access between them, but they will butt up against each other. And uh, runoff is, is um, will pitch away from this gap and, and flow off the sides, uh, similar to the way it does today. Uh, so the majority of the work, as I mentioned, is in the floodplain. Um, and I've had a lot of back and forth with um, Danielle over in the, um, the CPC office there. And, uh, you know, there's some discussion that I hope to continue tonight about locating a structure below the floodplain elevation that's specifically called out in the, uh, in the regulations that that should not take place. But um, really what we're looking at is, is matching what's there today. I think we have a, uh, an older building that at some point will need some some work, whether it's repair or reconstruction, um, you know, raising that slab to the floodplain elevation would actually result in more impact in the floodplain area. Um, and I think uh, the structure itself today really doesn't have any flood mitigation measures. So you're trying uh, to build that stop doing car. I'm sorry, is, is there a question? No, no, go ahead. Okay, so the, the existing structure doesn't have uh, any any sort of mitigation measures to be in the floodplain, um, but we're, what we're proposing is flood vents shown by these little black rectangles along both sides of this. So it essentially acts as a flow through. So if this structure should flood, the water will pass into the building and then can exit through those, those flow through. So we've submitted this to conservation as well. Clearly there's some impacts in buffer zones to wetlands and in the floodplain. Uh, it's been submitted to DEP. The, the meeting with conservation is uh, next week. I believe it's on the 10th of next Wednesday. Um, we've also received some feedback since this submission to the CPC from uh, really the feedback, the comments we received from the building commissioner, as well as the fire department. Um, the building commissioner has expressed some concerns over really more past, um, past issues with the site and the owner of Reading Lumber. And um, the, uh, the applicant here has already reached out to the commissioner to try and resolve those and um, kind of keep this project on track by taking care of things that may have happened in the past. Um, and my understanding from speaking with the uh, deputy chief Galvin is that he is generally fine with this proposal as long as there's sufficient distance. I think it's 25 feet from the 
uh, from the propane tanks, which we do provide. Um, the last piece really, this triangle here is uh, in order for this building, the new building to comply with setbacks in the highway business zone, um, we'll need to adjust the lot line, which is for the 124 property. And that's what we're showing here. This is approximate for now, but the plan would be to um, prepare, uh, prepare an a &R plan and formally adjust those lot lines. And hopefully we'll have that uh, before this commission um, for the next meeting. And, and uh, we can discuss that as well. But the idea is to adjust these lot lines, leave 124 as a fully compliant lot, uh, same with 110, and then we'll have sufficient setback from the new lot line for the structure. Um, so, yeah, uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, I think that's um, that's kind of the gist of it here. As I mentioned, we've had quite a bit of back and forth, a lot of it relating to kind of the past, but um, you know, what we're really seeking input for is, is the uh, construction of this new building here. And if there's any questions, comments, I'm certainly more than happy to, uh, to address them. Okay, thank you. Um, if you could remove your screen share so I can see everybody. But first thing I'd like to do is uh, ask Danielle about the, uh, the so-called back and forth. What was the uh, issues that you were bringing forth there, Danielle? The CPC, in order to issue a special permit in the floodplain district, has to find that five criteria are met. And um, one of them I was unsure about, which was um, the location of the structure uh, below the floodplain elevation. And um, I was a little confused about this because I, one, I didn't know if that was a provision that could be waived or under what circumstances it could be allowed or whether reconstruction triggered it also. So um, I had some discussions with the building inspector who referred me to someone at um, DCR who um, explained that in flood, and DCR actually has kind of control over the music, municipalities uh, uh, special permits for floodplain construction. and. So they deal with um, building permits and floodplain construction. Um, and what she advised me was that finished floor, the, 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 the finished floor elevation has to be one foot above the base flood elevation. And it doesn't matter if it was existing or not. Um, so what it, what it depends on for this particular building or for any building is we don't normally deal with interiors um, with the CPC, but in this case, we would have to make sure we knew what the inside would look like because that first, that finished first floor has to be a foot above the base flood elevation or it doesn't meet all the criteria of the special permit and the CPC is not supposed to issue the special permit. So at some point we will need to have a recommendation from the building inspector once that, that detail is given that that criteria is, is met. And the other thing that we have to um, get as a recommendation from the building inspector, um, it just the building code requires uh, certain waterproofing materials. And so those are things that no, don't normally go into our decisions, but because this is the floodplain, um, it does. So I don't think that's, I don't think that's information that we have entirely because we don't, we don't have that info. You know, Andy, is my my impression is that the reason you don't bring that floor up is because you'd have to do compensatory storage at one and a half. Well, we do provide compensatory storage even for what we're doing, and we provide more than uh, almost two to one, I think, for what we're impacting. Um, and I, I'm confident we can find a way to to do that. It's just really more of how the site functions today um, that we're just trying to match what's out there. I think the applicant would be willing to to work with that. Um, to me, it's, it's um, the, the question isn't necessarily even about this building, but as you make your way further down in the site, it gets lower and lower. Um, so if, <laughs> if in this case they need to raise it, I just wonder what that would mean for the future if they, uh, if they do come back with, with um, you know, future buildings that they want to construct. Well, it it looks like you'd have to bring that floor up about two feet, right? If we're to be one foot above, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so, so again, um, it's, it's, it, I'm sorry. That would mean that if you did do, if you did go to the next building over and begin to do it, you'd have to bring that one up too, so you could grade everything in so they'd match and so forth. Um, yeah, and, and and you know we could likely um, accommodate that. I think it's it's interesting in this case because it's an existing situation too, mm -hmm. because anything we do to raise buildings in the floodplain means more impacts in the floodplain, which is right. kind of the opposite of what conservation is likely going to tell me to do, you know, so it, it, it's just the point, you know, again, we're, we're happy to kind of make this work, but it just, 
it's a little bit of a different scenario in at least my mind because yep. we have an existing situation out there already. Okay, so, um, um, but you, if you did bring the floor up to the, requ the required elevation, you could eliminate the uh, flood mitigation uh, structures in the back. Those flood vents, well, we'd, yes. if we raised it up, we would, yeah, we, we would have to look at that. I mean, we'd have foundation. Yeah, we have, yeah, there's a good chance we wouldn't have to have those flood vents. We would just have more right. compensatory storage. Yeah. Yes, that, and that's, yeah. I think that's probably, the, that's usually the big issue is, right. can you find enough uh, square footage uh, right. on the lot to do your compensatory uh, at the one and a half requirement? So, um, so you know, do you, uh, do you feel that they, that you could, uh, and because it looks like that's a sticking point, and I had a feeling that's what it was going to be. Um, so do you have um, a, a sense that you, if you did bring it up to the re requisite elevation, um, that you could find that compensatory storage on the lot. I, I mean, and perhaps not right there, but around the back a little more, a little more west and a little more south of, on the lot there. Yes, I, I do. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly, I mean, right behind that building, it, um, it slopes up quite a bit. I mean, it's not yeah. a wall, but it's almost, it's earth, but it's pretty steep. I mean, that could be carved out. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's room, yeah. Yeah, because you would also have to, it would also require some filling in the front to create a driveway access to get right. into that building. Right. So it's yep. more than just a square footage of the building times the height, Correct. it's the additional uh, access driveway that you'd have to create compensatory for. That's correct. Yep. 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 So, um, okay, well, that's why I asked you the question generally, because rather than try to fight an uphill battle, sometimes it's uh, better if you can actually engineer your way out of it, as, as it were. Sure. So, uh, okay, uh, um, obviously we're gonna have to have this come back, but in, in the meantime, uh, anybody in the board, any questions, you have any questions on what you're looking at here? Yeah, Mr. Paris, this is uh, Dave. Um, Dave. So is, is there any relief is if, um, on this floor requirement if it's an accessory use? I mean, I, I'm very familiar with the, call it a shed, you know, it's just got lumber in it. And <clears throat> I would think by practice, they would, knowing they're in the floodplain, again, with the flood vents and stuff like that, they would, um, you know, have lumber stored at a prescribed height, uh, not a lot on the floor uh, for that reason. But it's, it's, it's not, is it applying the rule as far as the finished floor elevation to what amounts to a shed? I'm just wondering if there's any relief there. It's not like it's a living quarters, it's a place of business. Um, a lot of this is not only to protect the environment, but it's also to prevent loss, you know, financial loss um, that sometimes uh, would occur from a flood. So uh, if, they're, if we're putting in there that they would have to store it at a minimum height, so there'd be a minimum off the floor, wouldn't that achieve kind of what um, we're trying to do by raising the elevation of the finished floor. So that's why we need to know where the finished floor is and if there is one. So what DCR advised me was if there is no finished floor area, if it really were constructed just like a shed and there were, and it was just storage and that storage was above a certain elevation, then there's no issue. The issue comes when there is a finished first floor, if there's an office area, if there's any other type, if there's just something that that is considered a finished floor. So that's why we need to know what's inside because building the structure the way it's shown might not be a problem. It all just does depend on the interior. Um, and right. you know, the fact that it's accessory doesn't matter. Um, it just, it is a structure, I mean, based on the size. Um, when I first described it as a shed and then she saw the plans, she kind of laughed and said, that's not a shed, that's a structure. It's, you know, um, more than 3000 square feet. Um, but no, it, it just depends on what's inside. Well, I think also the, um, the Dave, that, that, that um, sort of, if you will, biting the bullet now and getting it right means that in the future, any use of that would be unrestricted as opposed to the restrictions you're running now. And I don't know that there's any um, um, material police that go around to make sure you keep everything at the right elevation, although it could be self, you know, self-preservation to keep your, 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 uh, your stock out of the water. Um, you would think that that would be okay. I'm not sure it even matters where they actually keep it. It matters where how it's constructed. So what's what's on the built like the plans for the building permit have to match what the special permit issued um, says. So like 
we can't just tell them, you know, keep the logs below a certain or keep them above a certain level. It, right. it has to do with how it's actually built inside. So it wouldn't be a condition we would put on it. So does Andy know what, uh, you know, what they plan to do inside? Is it the same thing? They just want to expand how much it can hold? Yeah, and Mr. Chair, can I share my screen again sure, real quick sure, here? So this is, um, this is a picture of the, uh, this is the shed, the the one, the uh, adjacent shed that the new one would butt up against. And the, the intent, it's a little smaller. I think there's only one door instead of two, um, but the intent is really to match this. So you've got, I mean, I, this is several feet of concrete foundation coming up from the uh, the slab. And then it's just really material stored inside. It's a steel structure. I mean, there's no plans for office. There's no, um, they really just want more space. That's That's really what it comes down to. Um, so it's no change in use, no, no plumbing, no, um, it might have maybe electrical at, at best, looks like they have some lights up there, but it's really just a steel structure on a concrete foundation, um, for storing materials. That'll be the whole thing. Mr. Chair, Danielle mentioned 3000 square feet. What is that referring to Danielle? Do you know? I think just the size of the, the proposed shed, was it 3,600 square feet? Was the size it's 30, 60 by 60. <clears throat> just just the reason why i just raised that is the, the definition in ibc irc the national building code the accessory buildings uh, used to be a max up to 2000 came out in 2005 went to 2009 and it used to be a max of 3000 on the 2015 um it went to unlimited and also um it went up to three stories in height. So sometimes a lot of people still refer to the 2009 uh, National Building Code. So it has changed how that, so it's that size building, if it's an accessory to the primary use of that business, it is considered an accessory building, it, you know, meaning a shed, if you want to call it that. And, um, and the reason why they changed that nationally is because it really isn't made for more urban or semi-urban places. It's made for farm and rural areas because uh, used to, people used to be limited when they own a farm of a 3,000 square foot building. They couldn't put tractors and other kind of accessory type vehicles and trucks into a structure so that the uh, National Building Code changed that in 2015 so that it would be unlimited. And seeing that most towns in more dense or urban places have zoning bylaws restricting sizes. So um, that's just a little history lesson on the building code. But I mean, we, we would, our own zoning bylaws would, would override that, you know, IBC. See, Dave, that's why we have you. Yeah. yeah. You're very valuable, Dave. You're very valuable. Know, the only no code stuff. In the yes, you and Ryan bring a lot to the table, both of you. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, that's, I guess, that's one of the questions. The other one, Warren, as we talk about Winter Street and Main Street, so this has another weird leg to it, is I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that jog in the back there for future, that future lot to the, I don't know if what direction is that, north or, I just, you know, that concerns me a little if that lot was ever to become available, we'd have this weird jog, like, we're, you're, you're, there's so many permits here going after, Andy here is, do we do we have to have that setback? Isn't that a ZBA? This is where I get outside of my area of expertise, but yeah. couldn't that grant you with the ZBA variance? You know, well, so they, yeah, they, that, if they wanted to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a setback variance for the setback, we've you uh, you if you recall, you've seen those come before us in the past, yep. for, primarily for residential though. Right, um, of course. But but, but still, it, it's it's a similar it to be a similar request. For a variance of the setback, so, um, but obviously they're trying to do the best they can to meet all of the code. I mean, they have enough issues to deal with, so if they can meet as many codes as possible, it makes it. No, I get it. I get it. I don't know if anyone else. Again, it's only because we're talking so much about these valuable lots that are all in this area of of uh, that we're all looking to is possibly future downtown of North Reading. Right. Um, I get really, I get a little protective of just that little odd jog there and what it could represent when you might get something built right there and you right. have to deal with this triangle going into their right. lot. Right, looking so forward to yeah. But um, I know there's a lot of work. 
Okay, so Andy, so you you're uh, you you're before the conservation commission. Um, do we um, well based on what David said, Danielle, do you think we can resolve this this uh, requirement for it to be um, a foot above the uh, flood zone, or do you think that's pretty much, if you pardon the expression, cast in stone? Well, for the finished first floor it is we don't have the ability to waive that but i don't really know what's considered finished first floor and i don't know like the whole i haven't i don't know what's inside the whole you know proposed new um structure so perhaps what we need to do then is uh you maybe have to take some of what we just heard from dave back to the building inspector and have you take a look to see if it qualifies as a shed in which case it may be not applicable no, I don't think so. Um, th this doesn't, I mean, from my conversation with, with DCR, it doesn't matter if it's successor or not. It's, it's that finished first floor is just for building in the floodplain. It doesn't matter what kind of building it is. Um, okay. So okay. That's, right, I well, think that's, that's the just question the, I was asking, I guess. Yeah, that's just the detail that we need is that those, in, that we just need to know about the interior of the building and so, in, so, if we, so if the interior of the building does not constitute a quote unquote finished first floor. It doesn't matter. It's just dirt. Yeah, yeah, then it no. doesn't matter. Then it doesn't matter. So, but it could be concrete and still not matter, right? As long as it's not finished. That's my understanding. I'd have to I work wonder, with Gary on that, but yeah, it shouldn't matter. I wonder, Mr. Chairman, sorry to interrupt, if, if there's a way if it's built at the same elevation as the grade but that, that kind of violates a little bit of building code rules with the eight inch rule. But I wonder if it is built at grade, it could be considered grade versus finished floor. Well, my estimate, well, again, we don't have a, uh, we don't have a, a, a plan, a foundation plan for it, if you will. But my estimation is that they would do something similar to what was next door with a couple of feet of reveal. And, um, and, right. and so that's why they need to put the flood vents in so that the water will pass through, come in and go back out or pass through, however it is that it works. So but this, it but this with the floodplain. But perhaps this is where it gives Jerry the opening because if you have what they show there, these four foot kick walls, you know, it's probably an eight inch frost wall, right? So it's a four, four foot above ground kick wall. Um, mm -hmm. It's sitting on just grade, if you will, you know, uh, the, the same elevation as, as what's around it right now. Uh, there's you never know there could just be an opportunity to to allow that <clears throat> because you know typically what the problem is building a grade would be your eight inches too low per the building code you know as far as it's six to eight depending on what you look at it but you need you're supposed right. to have the structure up that high but if you build it off a kick wall all the way around maybe you're accomplishing that and so it gets it gets back again so it's good practice but then you get back to the whole issue of is the is that floor considered grade or finished floor? And that's, I guess not, that's not on my call. So if I might, Mr. Chairman, what, what would be helpful yeah. to, to provide? I mean, more detail from the, from the owner about um, <clears throat> the construction materials. So is it, there's a meeting need to happen with the building commissioner. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what to, yeah, I how to kind of push to get these. Said, uh, the, you know, uh, the clear idea of what the inside of that building is going to look like. So we'll know if it can be can called a finished, a finished floor, finished first floor. And, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's the definition that we're looking for right now. And we don't, uh, we don't have that. So, uh, so some detail about what the inside of the building would look like would be probably step one. Okay. Uh, and then again, I, I, um, <clears throat> You know, I guess I would encourage you to look this over closely because if you can uh, meet that code, if you can get that uh, so that it's a foot above floodplain, I think it opens the door for a lot more uh, future use for that building than what you would have with what you're proposing. Okay. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll, I'll discuss that with them. I think they'd probably be open to that. And I, I, yeah. I do want to talk about that with conservation as well, because that, that yeah, does that take some of the, them. That'll take a lot of the bite out of the whole application. Yeah, yeah, and um, so yeah, that we, we'll, I'll talk through that with with both groups there, the owner and the okay. conservation. We'll talk about that next time too. Okay. Okay, um, Chris, you have a quick comment. Yeah, you know we're talking about this building. We've got about what, you know, uh, one hundred, the the lot next door that we're going to take a bite out of. What it looks like with all its storage of heavy equipment in that zone. 
and the building inspectors actually by, uh, filed a violation this year about what's stored there. Um, how are we gonna clean that up? This is our shot, this, this, this lot. The only place it looks good is, is the, the Reading hardware lumber building itself that faces Main Street. The lots on both ends are pretty bad. I mean, the, the, the south end is cleaned up a bit, but the far corner is pretty. I think the south end is where the violation was, actually. No, well, the violation, was it the south end? Yeah. Let's see. 110 Main Street. So is that the south end or is that the, that the north end, that the, the end we're dealing with? It's the south end. All right. So, but it all belongs to the same. I understand. Same place, understand. you know, um, and so, I, I just. So I think what we should do in this case, again, is we should defer to the building inspector temporarily and let him tell us what he, get a, get a letter from him about what it is that needs to be cleaned up because we're not going to have to hear this again after the goes through conservation and yep. that will be our opportunity to bring any of these other issues to a head. Okay. Uh, and so Andy, I would encourage you also to encourage the, uh, the uh, property owners to deal with the uh, building commissioner and make sure that they uh, address any concerns he has that will make whatever he gives to us as a, as communication, uh, probably a little easier to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and as I mentioned, they've they've started that dialogue, so they they are willing to. Yeah, we to, saw that. We read their we read this. our correspondent, so it yeah, like yeah. So they're, they're willing to work with them, and I'll um yeah. I'll continue yeah. to stress that that's important for this process. Yep. Yeah. Okay. My other okay. comments were already handled by Dave. Yes. So. Um. <laughs> okay. Brian, do you have anything? Any questions? Any comments? No, Andy, my one question was on the on the slab. Do they intend to reuse the existing slab and just expand it for the new building or demolish and pour a whole new slab? Uh, well, through you, Mr. Chair, they, they would, they would, um, everything goes. They take the building down, take the slab out, re rebuild right. it all in that location. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're not minimizing disruption with the, with reuse. We're just trying to maintain the elevation. Yeah, right. And, and they're, they're, they're concerned about their operations while well, they're in they're in conservation area, obviously. So they're mindful of debris, but they also have a, a, a company or a business to run too. So they're gonna um, have to they're gonna be trucking it out as soon as it comes down. Um, but they will demolish the whole the whole right. site, regrade it, and, and new slab and everything. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll put this on again for a continued public hearing. Um, before we do that, though, I'm gonna. Uh, I do have to. Uh, I will open it up since it is a public hearing. I will open it up to the public. If there's any questions from the public, um, <clears throat> please uh, indicate so. Uh, if you um, let me know, um, either by voice or by uh, waving your hand or something, and um, uh, please uh, identify yourself before asking a question and run all the questions to the chair. So, are there any comments or questions from the public? Okay, hearing none, um, then I'm going to, uh, um, I'm gonna close this for tonight and we'll uh, continue this um, to, a, to uh, a time after. Well, I guess we'll maybe perhaps the next- We have meeting. a motion. You have a motion? There. Well, I'm sure Ryan has the motion and the motions. Okay. Um, we'll let him do it this time. This is an easy one, Ryan. Okay. It only has, I'll take the it only has a dozen numbers in it. That's all. Okay, I'll go ahead. Chair, I move the Community Planning Commission vote to grant the requested continuance to the public here at 110 124 Main Street till Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, at 8.30 p.m. Nice. Okay, okay a motion and a second by Mr. Hayden. Is that true? No, I didn't second it. Was that Dave? Dave did. <laughs> Oh, Dave, I think, Dave, okay. did you second it? I said nice, but it, I'll say second. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'll second it. It doesn't have either way. I have a motion by Ryan and a second by Dave, okay? So now it's recorded that way. And uh, so all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Let the record show four in favor, no opposed. Okay, Andy, see what you can do. Come back. We'll see you in a while. And uh, 
Good luck with your conservation. Great. Thank you all very much. Have a good Great. night. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thanks. Okay. Okay, what do we got here? So you got a ZBA. Yeah, we got a ZBA. Um Okay, um, okay, so we'll do the ZBA and then we'll do the annual report, so. Okay, seven, Jacob Rayner Lane. The variants. Okay, it looks like- uh, On a brand new lot. From the left side setback for detached garage shed. What, um, Mr. Chairman, just a couple of questions and maybe everyone ha has the same ones that it seems weird. It kind of reminds me of a one of those ZBA ones that came by through us with it was a height, you know, looking to get a variance on the on the on the height and they didn't provide any dimensions or an elevation showing what they're trying to do. So I, I feel like this is similar kind of thing, like it doesn't say what size shed it doesn't show where they want to put it um i'm just like scratching my head here i'm not for or against I don't, i'm just trying to understand like what are they yeah. how, how does the zba do a ruling on this if all this information is advertised in advance will be presented on thursday what are exactly unless they slip in a document right last minute what are they what are they trying to build here other than Yep, that's a good question, and this is a very common occurrence where we get a ZBA without near enough information to make any kind of decision. No plan, a, no no uh, no, no uh, elevations, no no nothing. So essentially, we end up looking at it and trying to rule on the zoning issue pre presented, whether or not we think it's okay for them to violate the zoning bylaw, the setback in this case. Um, <laughs> But don't However, you need the context to do that? We have commented many times where the answer to the request for us to comment on it is not enough information for us to comment. And and basically that's our way of saying, you know, can you give us a little more next time? So uh, that may be where we're at right now. You're, you're correct. We don't have what we need to, to really uh, dig into it. All we can do is say, well, it looks like they want to add on to someplace and it looks like they want to uh, a setback. I mean, so we kind of look at the maps and see what the closest house is and see if, you know, and we basically would comment neighbors and not enough information. Right. It looks like they want to put a garage in the back corner of the driveway. But yeah. instead, instead, instead of pulling it over towards the house, they're going to push it over towards the lot line. Well, it says left side yard setback. Yeah. But, you know, they, they give us this lovely picture of of their uh of their plot plan and they don't put the house the the building on it it's like yeah I'm, I'm relying on the aerial and you can see i mean there's i i can see chris the reason why maybe they wouldn't put it against the house they could maybe do it forward of that but if you notice there's a an island north near the back end of of a set of stairs that kind of come up to the house and then um, it goes off to the rear and there's been subsequently some construction like basically from the where it shows proposed deck all the way back to the driveway is now terrace and deck and structure all basically uh parallel to that so i i get kind of that i'm just i'm just saying that and i'm not one of those like i need full set of plans you know for for a variance yeah, we'd well, like to know what it looks like yeah exactly you're you know i'm not saying you know i wouldn't put, put that burden on a, on a group that's first one to find out if, the, if this commission and the ZBA were even gonna rule on it, but I think you just need some minimum stuff, just saying like, this is where I wanna try to put it, or this is the footprint. So, you know, I'm just concerned even if ZBA grants it without any information, you know, I don't know how that works, you know? Yeah, one would hope that they are bringing a lot more information to the ZBA meeting than they brought to us. I mean, and that's all we can do at this point, because yeah. this is what we have. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess our comment would be neighbors and not enough information. Yeah, and, and not enough information. I would. Just, not, that's not would a just, common response from us. But I would just, bullet, uh, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I would just, I would just 
bullet it by just saying no stated size, no plan showing where approximately. And then also on the third bullet is, are, is anyone understanding? So the side setback on this is 25. This is the minimum. It's 25. Right. They get 30. Now on, a, on an, obviously on an accessory, it's 10 feet. Right. So what exactly are they asking for? Are they asking to go at four feet? Because they said they're looking for six foot relief. So I think that's what it is. Okay, so they're looking to go. I wish people would just put it in English. We're looking to go four feet off the lot line, and then I and then the structure is going to be bang, you know, this big. Because I mean, if you look at the aerial, the house next door. First off, the driveway is right on the lot line, so yeah. that you can see that. But you can see that in the plan here too. And but the the house is right there. It's not shown in their contours here on, on this uh, plot plan, but it is it is very close. So, you, and it's actually the front house because of the curvature of the cul-de-sac is actually facing the, um, you know, this side lot. So I would just be sensitive to that. But again, that's the ZBA's job, you know, unless it is hardship or something proved, I'm not sure why it would be granted, um, you know, but again, I, It'd be nice to have more information. Then you could get more context. Well, they have a uh, they have some um, a lot of recent members on the uh, on the ZBA right now, so um, they're probably still uh, learning some of the ropes. So, so um, well, it's just it's not it's not their fault though. This is coming from the applicant, isn't it? Well, I don't know how much more they actually have than what they gave to us. Oh, I see. So this comes from. I always thought this is just coming directly from. No, what, you know, what they do is every time they get a ZBA application, they give it to they give us they give it to us to ask us to comment on it. We, we, we and we're supposed to comment on on zoning and and recommendations that we you know from our experience. So, but a lot of times, unfortunately, including this time, there's not enough information for us to really give a clear and concise answer to this. So, so all we can say is you know don't impact the neighbors and um, and um, we have occasionally. Um, Put a big the word hardship with a big question mark because essentially the uh, you know variances aren't supposed to be granted without they're proving a hardship of some kind. What's the most times there's no hardship that they can use. Right. And so is there Especially there must on already this. be garages on this on this house? It's probably garage unders of some kind. There's on three, it. I'll bet you. So no, how there's many more two, garages than they need. It's a two-car garage coming in that forward section. Okay, yes. so oh, okay. they really need yeah. another garage, you know what I mean? Gonna have your toys. Is there a hardship? So, so, so because the you know the zoning board of appeals is there to appeal a decision, um, or what would be considered to be the decision would be no, you can't do it because you violate the setback. So you'll go to the board of appeals to ask for relief from that um, from that uh, zoning bylaw. So it's, if you know they either grant it or they don't, but theoretically there's a hardship involved, and the the variance is granted based on the hardship. So does a hardship exist? We don't see one here, uh, but that's again, not our decision. Right, okay, I'm good, thank you. So what we can do is perhaps uh, where there being more recent members on there, perhaps we could put a note in there that we would appreciate uh, more information uh, available to us perhaps the next time and maybe that will happen. So we have occasionally got some pretty complete applications and been able to oh, yeah. find yeah. them pretty clearly, but this one is not one of them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that? Does is that that's you understand what we want to do, Danielle? Just something simple here. Okay. <laughs> I thought you did. <clears throat> okay. Um so um annual report. I don't usually get these to you in time to actually discuss it at a meeting, but uh, finished it early this time. So I thought I would, I mean, it's pretty similar to what we normally do, but yeah. just wanted to know if anyone had any. Sort of a recap of what you did last night? Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> basically. It's in writing of what she did last night. That's all. <laughs> it looked pretty good. I outlasted all you guys last night. I was on there. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, oh, Warren's still on. And then I look up. He's gone. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had to leave. Janie got home with the groceries, so yeah, I went to help her. It was yeah. interesting, though. I, I thought so too. I stayed as long as I could, but I have other things going on, so I, so I had to move on. Um, 
um, stuff there to be ready for today's today's day. Um, so um, do you want to just say any high points or you just want to, uh, Danielle, or you just... Uh... Honestly, it was it was very similar to what I put together for both the budget narrative and, you know, just what I presented last night. It's just I tried okay. to sum up the things that we did over the past year and what we hope to do next year. Um, yeah. And you, you did know. your usual good job. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, but if you had any feedback, any changes, anything you think I left out, just, you know, you can shoot me an email. I, I was going to get it to Karen within the next week or so. so. Okay. 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 So um, no 239 North Street, huh? Right. Okay. So I believe that uh, unless you have any uh, updates for us, then... I did just want, I have a couple questions on the Winter Main Street project. Um, I'll keep it quick because it's, these are really just kind of follow up questions since our last meeting. Um, mm -hmm. So Abacus and I have been talking quite a bit um, to try to figure out follow up and next steps and everything. I'm pulling together. They asked me for, you know, a stakeholder list, like who are people they should reach out to and how um, boards and committees, etc. So I'm working on that. Um, and I guess um, in terms of next ways of reaching out, um, what I, I mean, I'm working on drafting a letter um, with them um, that I also want to have the town administrator look at because I want to be sure what we say about sewer is, you know, just as right. accurate as it can be. Um, and then um, I think the plan would be to just send the letter to each of the property owners, abutters, um, right immediately around. And then, um, you know, requesting that they, uh, you know, contact us and um, asking if they'd be willing to have a, you know, a conversation, you know, over Zoom, a virtual meeting. Um, I can, if you want to see the text of the letter, like once I just make sure that it's, you know, okay, as far as everything in it being right. accurate, do you, do you want to see that before it goes out? Um, yeah, we I should have to wait till the next meeting. We have to see it before, but in the process of sending it out, we should see what you're writing because I, I'm, I'm a... Again, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we get a good response to it, but it's not the same as inviting them to an in-person meeting. And, and we know that, and we know that we may not get the level of response that we would get with an in-person meeting, uh, but I can hope that well, we can hope. Yeah, yeah, okay. And there's been a couple of changes in the in, the, in some of the requests, so we'll, we'll do that. And then okay. we'll, um, and, uh, we'll talk a little more about what, what's going on over there. Yeah, I thought, you know, the, the gist of it was really going to be, um, you know, we, we have reached out before. I mean, we have, I, we have spoken to each owner at some point in the past about right. the possibility of looking at this property. And, you know, now we've done some work. We'd really like to um, share what we've done, get your feedback, um, because in order to move forward in any way, shape, or form, I mean, really next step is we, we have to talk to the people on the property. Right. So, um, uh, but that's really the gist of it. And, true, yes. um, yeah, I, I think, you know, as I, once I'm confident that everything in it is as it's supposed to be, I can, I can stick it in the share file if you want to take a look at it, maybe okay, give good. a little bit of feedback. Um, and then the next question, Abacus wanted to know whether we wanted to consider, like, how we want to, how we want to treat ownership of the project moving forward. Does it stay with the CPC as it is right now? Do we want a committee? Like, how do we want to do that? I, I assume that the answer would be that it would stay with the CPC, but I did want to bring that question to you because I don't want to answer for you without asking. Well, I think there's some there's some other possibilities that are coming down the road. I think so. We might want to keep it in the in the CPC for now. Okay. And I, I, does anybody have any any different feel any different than that? No, I think at some point we bring the EDC in on it a lot, yeah. you know, a lot closer, but. You know, I, who's going to be left on EDC right now? I don't know. Yeah, so we, we'll uh, we'll keep it in the CPC right now, um, and then we'll uh, and and for just for a little bit longer, and then as as we as we begin to get a feel for how it's going to grow, then then we can open it up. Okay. Okay. I think um, that will address that. Okay. Right okay, now. that's great. Um, and I did want to ask one of the things that Abacus has also mentioned is whether we want to consider um, getting someone like, for example, like when we hired, what we didn't hire, he didn't did it for free, but when George Cole came to speak with us, do we want to hire a development consultant, maybe as a follow up to be thinking in the future? Um, and he had recommended that, you know, $10,000 might be an amount of money if we thought we wanted to spend something like that, not immediately right now, but mm -hmm following this project, following our contract with them. And I didn't put anything like that into our budget because 
I think that would be either a warrant article um, or something like that. It wouldn't be, it's not operating money because we'd be spending right, it right. one time. Right, right, but right. I wanted but, to know if you thought there was interest, whether that was something I should submit to request for June town meeting or possibly for October. I just wanted to see if there was any thought about that, any interest in that. Well, um, we could wait. <laughs> yeah, I'd like that. We, you know, I'm really, I really want to, I really am. Uh, I really want to see what happens at the stakeholders meeting. Yeah. Okay. I, really I think I, that's going to be. I think that's going to be key because because if we get the the if we get the kind of response that I hope we get, then we're going to take that to town meeting, and that's how we're going to get the money. Because but if we mm -hmm. don't, because we don't have the answer to that question yet. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. So, okay, so Warren, that's what Warren, we need to do. I I think last night that was uh, Mr. O'Leary was kind of fishing around. Yeah. You know, and that, and I was thinking about that. I just couldn't put, you know, I knew there was some money we were talked about and that's exactly right. what it was for. Um, yeah. But that's just, you know, but it, you're right. It does it not belong in the budget. It was a good thought that he had, but I don't oh, think. Oh yeah, it no, it doesn't that. belong in our budget though. It, it's a, it's a standalone yeah. item. Yeah, I Absolutely. do. Believe, I believe Danielle's right. That's a war on yeah. So. yeah. Mr. Studo. I, um, I just, well, I like to make a suggestion as liaison for the select board. I think that, um, well, two comments. One, I, I do think Danielle, and this is just my opinion, I think you should lead getting the stakeholders together. I, I, I think we mentioned the last meeting and the TA said the same thing. I do not think advocates should be leading this charge. And that's something where I'm not the only person that thinks this outside of this CPC. And then secondly, I think it's time, and again, I, I don't know the process, but I think it's time that maybe a representative from the CPC and abacus comes to the select board with their presentation, because I feel that you're going to hear some very different opinions that have been discussed now. And again, it's not a, a select board matter right now, but I think that, um, you know, we do have five people who, you know, I, I don't know how anyone else looks at it. I know how I do, but I, I think you're going to get a very different perspective on what abacus presented than what you've heard so far. Okay. Um, do you, uh, Mr. Studo, are you saying before we have the stakeholders meeting or? No, after? no, no. After budget season, because right now, with, okay. uh, with I mean, you saw no after, time. Dave, okay. I give you credit for staying on as long as you did. Me, Mr. Walner, and Mrs. Gonzalez were on till 1030, and that was a short meeting, as they can attest to. <laughs> um, so, but after that, I just, um, again, it goes back to the, what Mr. Warren was kind enough to Mr. Pierce was kind enough to tell me when I first went to my first meeting that for something this big we definitely want I mean I'm we're not going to agree on anything on everything but I, I I just think at this point I think it's important for the CPC abacus to hear the full select board's opinion because like I said there's there's some differing views and I think they should be heard before we get to the point where any you know we get too far down the road and then it's like, oh, you guys had X, Y, and Z concern. I didn't know. So there's- Yeah, I'd say, in other words, you're saying we should we should uh, have a stakeholder meeting then bring the whole thing to the board of select before we ask for any money. Correct. With <laughs> Abacus there presenting the same exact presentation I saw yeah. to the whole board. Yes. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think that, I think we kind of planned that all along. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. So maybe yeah. I- yeah. But, uh, but we really need, but, but you know, the viability of the project is important and, and the stakeholders are going to help us determine that. And so that's what our next step is so that when we do bring it, we know if there's viability. I think thank that's you. important. Yep. And again, thank you for allowing me to share yeah. that. I just wanted to, you know, just trying to well, you're coordinate always, the two boards. <laughs> you're, always, you're always welcome, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just um, ask a question? Oh. Go ahead. Just with, um, as far as outreach goes, I mean, I definitely didn't envision Atticus being in charge of outreach or, or, or leading the conversation with the stakeholders, but I do think they'd be important to have in terms of presenting. I mean, were we saying that it, we might not want to include them in that or just that they shouldn't be the leader and the presenter of, you know, hi, landowners, this is what we're thinking, you know, that, I guess I just want to be clear what the- Chair Pierce, can I, I clarify? My if I may. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, now I would, um, I would, the way I'd envision it is that we would bring them in if we, or we get them in and we would do an opening statement of some kind explaining what we've been doing. And then um, 
sort of the way when a subdivision comes before us, we get the whole presentation from the attorney or from whatever, and then the engineers fill in the blanks. And I, that's the way I see it, that we would basically explain the, pro the progress and everything that we've done so far, and then we'd let advocates be the engineer and fill in the blanks and answer the questions. So I think right. that's what this dude was talking about. And I yeah, agree. Yeah, uh, Chair Pierce, sorry. Uh, to clarify, no, Danielle, I didn't mean that they're not involved. I just meant that I thought you said that they would be the ones reaching out to the no. landowners, and no. that was, no. and I misunderstood. I'm, my apologies. No. That's I know, but your 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 intuition is correct. So that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, they're telling me. Um, they're they're trying to figure out how best to to for for the outreach to happen. So they're kind of advising me as to what they think should happen, but they're totally deferring to us as far as what we think yep. is appropriate. Um, yep. Now, you know, I guess one, actually, as we're talking about it, I'm, I'm realizing the question is, I think we were thinking maybe individual meetings, but are we envisioning one meeting or two meetings of lots of stakeholders of multiple landowners and abutters? I mean, is that... Well, I hadn't, we... really, uh, hadn't really thought about that. Um, I kind of had, had um, envisioned a... Um, a meeting with all of them there, but but now that you say that, that could just end up being uh, convoluted after a while. And so I think in smaller groups, it might be easier to answer the questions. So we yeah we may want to do it in in three phases or something. I think the landowner should be the first phase. Well, and stay cold, you know, right, you know, they, but in, and not with other, you know, not with a whole bunch of, of other people around, because they'll start picking no, on things no, that have been no. bad now. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the stakeholder, the stakeholders we would do perhaps in phases, so, and yeah. uh, so I do that. So Rich, you had a comment? Rich Walner? Yes. I just kind of actually just agree with what you just said, which is that it should be, you know, individual conversations with the seven stakeholders to get started. Yep. And then, uh, you know, you can open it up more afterwards. Yep. I'll also comment that uh, when it does go before the select board, it'd be more than just abacus. Abacus, I think, would have the ability after they get some feedback from the stakeholders to change the plan right. as they, they might see fit, right? So it's not going to be the exact same presentation that we've seen before because it's a work in progress. Also, yep. I think the other part of this is that we do get to the presentation where the select board or with the stakeholders, there's, there's a lot of history that happened before we even got to this development part. And so I look at all the studies we've done and the amount of- uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, Chair Pierce, I'm sorry, I, I have to interrupt. We got a legal opinion. Ms. Gonzalez is here. I, as a f official capacity as liaison, I can answer any questions even on behalf of Rich, but we're breaking open meeting law right now. Oh, There's two select board members. Here. Rich cannot give the opinion he's giving in the form he is, and we have a legal opinion that's behind it. That's actually not accurate, Vincenzo. I can. Okay. I, you can speak in a public hearing. This is not a public hearing. It's a discussion. I'm asking on behalf of the select board. This is, a public, this is a public hearing. No, it's not. It is a discussion. It is not listed right. as a public hearing on the agenda. Yeah, it's not a public hearing, Rich. No, Sorry. it's not a public hearing. We're in a public meeting. Okay, so I just, wanted, I just wanted to be clear. I went and spoke to Barb Stats about this, and as long as if the chair acknowledges me, then I can speak. And I'm not deliberating. I am speaking just my own opinion. And that that was Barb Stats told me that very clearly, and that was written down. It's in the open meeting laws, and it was written down by Michael as well. So I'm not deliberating. I'm I'm giving an opinion, and that's it. And I and everybody knows who I am. So. Okay, it's a confusing topic. I'll just say, but the, the chair yeah. okay. recognizes me. Well, we have a, we have a, we have a good idea where you're going with it. So, uh, Rich, if you're all set, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I I think we uh, I think we kind of agree on how we're going to approach this. So. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I I believe that's us for tonight. Unless you have anything else, Danielle. Um. No. That that's all for now. Okay. I want to thank everybody for coming, members, especially the, the Board of Selectmen members that showed, that showed up. Thank you very much. Um, and we will be uh, seeing you again soon, hopefully as again soon at our at our next meeting. Obviously, we have a few things we've moved on, so. I just so, want to I just want to say thank you. Um, I, I, thought that, I thought that 5G information was just, I'm really glad I was here to hear it. 
Yeah. So very interesting. I'm glad you I've listened. That's, that's important. While, obviously, and I had a lot of questions <laughs> about how that's all going to work. And yeah. So, you know, it's nice to hear it before it comes to us. Right. And have a little bit of background on it, you know. So. Right. Hey, Warren. That. Yes. We, 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 you know, we, we, we did the, the original meeting and learning about all the, you know, the antennas. Cell towers. Yeah, cell towers back in the day. You know, we didn't want any of them in town either, but we decided we had to know about them so we could let them in because the, we were told that we had to let them in. Right. And now we, you know, we no longer really have too much oversight because they've taken it away because other towns and states have just barred it, which, which is what's hurting everybody now. So what? I, so that's why I want I want to be a, have a chance to read that law. Yeah. The, way, the, the uh, what what's what's in it to see what exactly how constrained we are, and uh, and also see some pictures of of a of a unit. Everything I said before, I still want to see because that will help us, um, you know, decide exactly how we go about this. Or right. If, you know. Yeah. If we can go about it. Yeah. I mean, or or if we can't go, if we have to go about it, we need to know. Yeah. So. So, yeah. So again, so uh, thank you, Leanne, for your for your input, and Mr. Studo for your input. And we will uh, we'll see you again. And Rich also, we'll see you uh, we'll see you later on. So good night to all. Good night. Thanks, Danielle. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Good night, all. Good night.